Colleagues, uh, please take your seats and we will get started. Um, the first item of business is just to explain that um, I'm taking the chair, I'm Claude Moraes, I'm the rapporteur, but I'm taking the chair in the absence of Juan Fernando Lopez Aguilar, who is absent, but also our vice chairs in order of sequence are also unable to take the chair, so I'll be taking the chair this afternoon um, in order of sequence. Could I announce, first of all, that we, because we have the smaller room today, uh, we will only have translation in German, English, French, Greek, Spanish, Hungarian, Italian and Polish. So my apologies to anyone who um, will not receive translation in their language. Um, colleagues, we're moving to our eighth hearing. Um, it's difficult to um, imagine that we've already had seven hearings, uh, but we have. And we're moving to our eighth hearing, which um, is a, a slight gear change. Up till now, we've had a number of, um, I believe, well-organized hearings focusing on the legal and data framework, um, very much focused on the US uh, situation. Today, uh, we're focusing very sharply now on the uh, legal situation at a number of levels uh, uh, focused on the EU, at national level, EU level, Council of Europe level, and at the international law level. Um, this afternoon, we'll also be looking at uh, pending legal cases, which I know are of uh, great interest to uh, all of us in this room and those watching on the web stream. Um, without uh, further ado, I want to um, introduce the speakers, but just to, um, before the three presentations, I wanted to um, just explain again that we will, because of the tightness of time and because we've added an additional speaker in the second session, um, and because a number of our shadows are not present, uh, we will take, um, after the presentations, uh, the shadows, myself as rapporteur, and questions from the, any members who want to speak, and then we'll take the questions with the permission of the shadows, given that we don't have many of the shadows present. Is that okay with my colleagues? I'm just looking at my colleagues to see if that's okay given that there's only one shadow present at the moment. Axel, is that okay with you? <laughs> if you're nodding, that's, 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 I'm having a conversation with my one shadow colleague here. If everyone else just wants to, uh, just, uh, is that okay with you, Mr. Voss? Um, given there is one shadow present, I think that's how we'll proceed. Um, colleagues, uh, as I said, we're going to focus now on three presentations covering the different fields of law um, and this gear change of looking at whether uh, fundamental rights and law has been breached in relation to the alleged surveillance activities uh, that we're looking at. Uh, first of all, international law, then the ECHR, and then EU law. Um, the first um, speaker, Professor Martin Shannon, is um, going to deal with the international law um, He's over here, the international law perspective. Um, he's currently professor at the European University Institute. He was formerly the UN Special Rapporteur on the promotion and protection of human rights while countering terrorism. Professor Shannon is also leader of the so-called Survey Project, uh, financed by the seventh EU Research Framework Programme. The Survey Project deals with ethical issues, legal limitations, and efficiency of surveillance. Uh, Professor Shannon uh, will cover in particular uh, the international law framework. Um, Professor Shannon, you have the floor and you're going to speak for 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Distinguished members of the European Parliament, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor to appear before this esteemed committee in this important matter of inquiry. As the chair just explained, my task is to look into the international law issue as to whether the electronic mass surveillance, mainly by the United States and the UK authorities, amounted to a breach of international law. The short answer to the question of lawfulness 
is that both of those countries have been involved and continue to be involved in activities that are in violation of their legally binding obligations under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights of 1966. This covenant is one of the main United Nations human rights treaties ratified by 167 countries in the world and uh, a predecessor uh, in terms of drafting to the European Convention of Human Rights, although the European Convention was finalized earlier. Neither the US nor the UK have accepted the right of individual complaint under the covenant, which would allow the pertinent quasi-judicial body of independent experts, the United Nations Human Rights Committee, to assess whether the country violated the covenant in respect of a specific individual. There are nevertheless two other mechanisms at the level of international law through which the same committee can address treaty compliance by these or other countries. Both the UK and the US have accepted the procedure for interstate complaints under Article 41 of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Even this procedure has not been resorted to so far. Um, the fact that two Western democracies are involved in what appears to be a massive interference with the privacy rights of EU citizens and others, coupled with the unavailability of individual redress would provide an instance where the EU countries should seriously consider triggering the interstate complaint mechanism. Independently of that option, both countries are subject to the single mandatory monitoring mechanism under the Covenant, the duty to submit periodic reports for the consideration by the Human Rights Committee, which will then, in its concluding observations, assess compliance or non-compliance. By coincidence, the United States is up for such review later this week and the United Kingdom next year. Next, I will address the question why uh, the US practices of electronic mass surveillance are in breach of Article 17 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. As you can see on the slide, the central privacy provision in the ICCPR is brief as it, for instance, lacks a fully articulated test for permissible limitations. But this doesn't mean that there would not be a clear and binding legal norm capable of being applied through institutionalized practices of interpretation, such as complaint mechanisms or the reporting procedure. The provision prohibits unlawful interference with anyone's privacy or correspondence, and it establishes for all states, parties, a positive obligation to create a legal framework for the effective protection of privacy rights against interferences or attacks, irrespective of whether such interference or attacks come from the state itself, foreign states, or private actors. In 1988, Indeed, already a quarter of a century ago, the Human Rights Committee adopted a general comment number 16 on Article 17. Usually these general comments codify the committee's interpretations of a specific treaty provision based on earlier practice, including the consideration of individual complaints and state reports. By 1988, such material under Article 17, privacy, was quite limited and therefore the general comment could not possibly address all current concerns related to privacy rights. That said, as you can see from the two excerpts chosen to this slide from the general comment, nevertheless it does clearly address the question of uh, interferences requiring legal basis and the privacy rights being extended to the sphere of computers, data banks and other devices already in 1988. As United Nations Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Counterterrorism from 2005-2011, this speaker issued an one annual report uh, to the main intergovernmental human rights body of the United Nations, the Human Rights Council, which is separate from the Human Rights Committee, and that report is of direct relevance for the current inquiry. The thematic report on the right to privacy in the fight against terrorism was considered by the Human Rights Council in March 2010. The report includes a proposal that the Human Rights Committee would replace its existing general comment 
on Article 17 with a new one, building upon the work of the committee since 1988. In my privacy report uh, as Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Counterterrorism, I based myself on the old general comment, other practice by the Human Rights Committee under Article 17, and overall work by the Human Rights Committee, including a fresh general comment on a parallel right to freedom of movement to develop uh, a rigorous test for permissible limitations in relation to privacy rights. The test includes these cumulative conditions for the determination whether an interference with privacy rights is justified or whether it amounts to a violation of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights as a matter of international law. Restrictions must be provided by the law. The essence or core of any fundamental right, including privacy, is inviolable. Restrictions must be necessary in a democratic society. If there is discretion in implementing restrictions, that discretion must not be unfettered. It is not necessary to serve a legitimate aim. The effects of the restriction must be proven to reach that legitimate aim. Restrictions must be proportionate, which means they have to be appropriate. They must mean the least intrusive uh, method, and they must provide proportionality in relation to the actual legitimate interest served. And finally, restrictions besides complying with privacy itself must not result in violations of other human rights. In the written uh, text of this statement, I am going through these elements of a cumulative permissible limitations test and concluding that the uh, overall e-surveillance architecture developed by the National uh, Security Authority of the United States did violate uh, several elements of the uh, permissible limitations test, resulting in a breach by the United States of Article 17 of the ICCPR. In other words, we are going beyond what could be justified as permissible limitations. The surveillance conducted constituted an unlawful or arbitrary interference with privacy or correspondence, uh, and this conclusion follows independently from multiple grounds. Due to time constraints, I'm only referring to some of them. Uh, the surveillance was not based on existing provisions of law as required by human rights law. It was based on vague and broad provisions of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act and the operation of a secret court um, resulting in secret case law not allowing individuals to adjust their conduct to something which could be uh, foreseeable uh, in the public domain. Furthermore, um, even if reference is made to so-called metadata, the inviolability of the core of privacy is at issue because the more systematic the collection and analysis of metadata is, the more clear it is that it becomes intrusive in relation to the highly sensitive personal relations and highly sensitive categories of personal information. So metadata no longer is free game. Furthermore, the surveillance was not limited to metadata. Metadata was just a trigger that then allowed for accessing also so-called content data. I will skip the other parts of the application of the uh, test for permissible restrictions and um, uh, simply move to addressing some work within the current surveil project mentioned by you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you have in your files uh, copies of some pages of our matrix of surveillance technologies. I see that on the screen the graphics haven't come through properly. It's a multiple, uh, multi-dimension and multidisciplinary assessment of surveillance technologies where the fundamental rights scoring is basically based on two factors, the importance of a fundamental right in a given context, and then the depth of intrusion, which are multiplied with each other, resulting in a maximum score of 16, and then subject to two, two further revisions as to whether judicial authorization was given and as to the reliability of the assumptions behind the assessment. Surveil work 
continues to develop this semi-quantification of surveillance te technologies, uh, we are comparing the fundamental rights intrusiveness score with a technolo te technology assessment usability score, and then adding to that assessment traffic lights, red, yellow, green, related to ethical issues raised by uh, the use of surveillance technologies. Mr. Chairman, in my written statement, I referred to some other developments at the United Nations level, uh, in addition to the question of a general comment on our, under Article 17 and current compliance with Article 17 of the ICCPR. Um, Germany has taken an initiative of an amending or additional protocol to the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, uh, which is an issue worth studying, but that nevertheless cannot um, make less important the need to assess under the current status of law violations of privacy rights. Um, my statement concludes with a number of recommendations, starting that the Parliament should carefully study the outcome of Human Rights Committee's consideration of the U.S. periodic report later this week. Uh, the Parliament should consider the option of initiating an interstate complaint in relation to the United States for breaches of Article 17 of the ICCPR. The Parliament is recommended to consider both the question of a need for a new general comment or a protocol, amending protocol proposed by Germany. Furthermore, the Parliament is recommended to keep itself informed of domestic and European efforts to address the involvement of the United Kingdom and its GCHQ in massive intrusions into the privacy of EU citizens with a view to determining the need for its own action. Further, Parliament is recommended to pursue its own line of work in relation to the issue of intelligence oversight in Europe, both at national and EU level. And finally, uh, Parliament is recommended to support continued research, including under Horizon 2020, um, related to the right to privacy, the right to the protection of personal data, and the challenges posed by surveillance and evolving surveillance technologies. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Professor Shannon, and thank you for um, sticking to your time. Just to repeat that the, your full presentation is, up, is now being uploaded to the Libe uh, website, including that presentation, uh, for anyone who wants to see the full presentation. Um, I'm going to start with the shadows, uh, beginning with uh, Mr. Voss. Um, sehr geehrter Herr Schenin, ja. Ähm, vielen Dank für Ihren Vortrag. Es war sehr interessant, ähm, hier über den CCPR zu hören. Ähm, zum einen habe ich noch mal folgende Fragen. Unter lässt der CCPR eine Unterscheidung zwischen In- und Ausländern zu? Gibt es dort einen Anhaltspunkt? Dann darüber hinaus gibt es nur... Rechtsschutzmöglichkeiten der Staaten oder auch der Bürger, die dort vorgeschrieben werden. Dann eine weitere Frage hinsichtlich einer möglichen Verletzung der dort genannten Rechte. Ist alleine das Speichern von Daten schon eine Verletzung oder ist lediglich die Analyse oder die Verwertung von Daten? Und dann ist eben ganz generell, Sie hatten das eben schon mal angekündigt, selbst wenn man den Artikel 17 jetzt hier gebrochen hat, was gibt es eigentlich für Folgen? So wie ich es verstanden hatte, die zwischenstaatliche Beschwerde. Aber ähm, das heißt, es ist auf einer reinen Staatenebene jetzt für Bürger so generell zunächst erstmal nichts möglich, möglicherweise. Und dann ähm, die Frage, hat es sonstige Folgen noch? Danke. Thank you, Mr. Voss. And now to Mr. Albrecht. We are collecting the questions, or? Yes. Because magically everyone is sticking to time, uh, and I don't know what's going on here, but. Um, okay. The presentation was on time, you're on time, so can we going to collect the questions, if that's okay? 
Okay. First of all, uh, thank you very much for that important outline. Um, it's, it's obviously an issue that uh, there are infringements, at least possible infringements, to international law, and no uh, government is pointing at it. Um, so my question uh, would be, uh, is there any um, indication that uh, any governmental, uh, so any, any government or any international organization is at the moment investigating these in possible infringements, and um, uh, what would you expect uh, with regard to ongoing uh, infringements of these rights to be done now from political level? Because obviously. Uh, this needs to be also looked at from, from us and from the national parliaments in Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. And uh, just a final question from our shadow rapporteurs and, and from myself as rapporteur. You mentioned, uh, Professor Shannon, the um, Human Rights Committee meeting um, with the US in Geneva. Could you comment on what your expectations are for this meeting? I mean, do you envisage the US accepting recommendations from the committee for the new protocol to A17 of the ICCPR? And what, what are your expectations? If you could give us um, some political analysis, perhaps. Uh, if you could answer those questions, and then I'll go on to our members after that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There were already a number of questions. First, Mr. Voss, um, the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, as Human Rights Treaties generally, does not distinguish between citizens and non-citizens. It's very rare that human rights would be reserved to citizens only. In the ICCPR framework, there are two rights where that is relevant. One is the cluster of political rights of participation in Article 25, which often are reserved on the national level to citizens only. And the second one is the um, right of a citizen not to be expelled from his or her own country. So certain dimensions of movement, movement across borders are different for foreigners and citizens. But for instance, privacy rights apply equally to every human being, be the person a citizen or not. A separate question then is the so-called extraterritorial effect of the ICCPR. The United States may contest the applicability of its covenant obligations outside its national borders, such as in Europe, and therefore might say that whatever they do in Europe is not subject to their ICCPR obligations. The Human Rights Committee has from the very beginning dismissed this perception, uh, starting from early Uruguayan cases, out of which the case of López Burgos is perhaps the m m best uh, known case, where the committee was very clear in formulating general statements about we are not dealing with where the violation occurred. It's the relationship between the violating state and the individual which results in a breach of the covenant. So even if it's a foreigner, even if it happens outside the national borders, still the state is held to account under the ICCPR. That has been codified to another general comment, number 31, where the uh, Human Rights Committee paraphrases the text of Article 2, which is on general state obligations, in a form which makes this very clear. Your other uh, questions related to the consequences of a breach. Um, indeed, the interstate complaint procedure is the one available in respect of the United States as that country has not accepted the right of individual complaint. A majority of all countries in the world has accepted that complaint mechanisms for, mechanism for individual 113 countries, which is as such remarkable success for the United Nations human rights treaty monitoring mechanisms. But the US and the UK have not. And therefore, what remains in the field of complaints is an interstate complaint. And I do not know what is considered within diplomatic circles, but I wouldn't be surprised if, for instance, certain Latin American countries are considering an interstate complaint in respect of the US, and why shouldn't European countries uh, think about it as well? There are, of course, the general mechanisms of uh, state responsibility under public international law, which also can be invoked, including in diplomatic relations, as a question of not merely politics or policy, but as breaches of international law. 
uh, citizens can address the Human Rights Committee, which, as said later this week, will deal with the uh, uh, report by the United States of America. And the chair asked, what are my expectations for that review? Um, we will have a set of concluding observations on 1st of November by the Human Rights Committee. The committee has posed a question, question number 22, or a line of questions related specifically to the NSA surveillance architecture. And one can expect at a minimum an expression of concern or grave concern, uh, perhaps a clear statement of incompatibility with Article 17. The jury is still out. The committee hasn't even met with the US, so I cannot. Uh, tell what option will be chosen. Um, uh, Mr. Voss asked whether the mere storing of information amounts to a breach. It may or it may not. Um, we are dealing with a whole range of various surveillance methods and an architecture which builds upon different pieces. Uh, it's easy to assess that in, it, in its totality this will amount to a breach of Article 17 of the ICCPR. But what, at, at what stage we have reached that threshold, that's a different matter. Um, intentional storage for the purpose of use uh, for thorough combing of metadata triggered through several hops to associated individuals and ultimately ultimate re resulting in accessing also content data certainly is a breach of the ICCPR. Um, I think I answered also Mr. Albrecht's question about what other countries are doing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Are there any follow-ups from either of you? No. Axel, you have a follow-up quickly. Recht herzlichen Dank für die Erläuterung. Ich habe zwei kleine Nachfragen. Zum einen Kann auch die Europäische Union eine zwischenstaatliche Beschwerde einreichen? Zum einen und ähm, darüber hinaus, wenn Sie, ich gehe mal davon aus, auch ähm, ähnliche Informationen wie wir erhalten oder das lediglich aus der Presse entnehmen und auch keine Bestätigung von irgendwelchen Dingen diesbezüglich erhalten, wie stellen Sie denn dann tatsächlich fest, ob hier Artikel 17 auch verletzt worden ist? Weil wir können uns ja bislang nur auf Presseerklärungen stützen, dann Expertengespräche, die aber jetzt auch nicht sagen können, ja, da wurde was gespeichert oder nicht. Wir gehen davon aus, dass das so ist. Aber letztlich, wenn man in dieses Rechtliche einsteigt, müsste man ja irgendwie auch eine Grundlage haben, auf was man sich stützt. The answer to the first question is no, and the answer to the second question is yes. Uh, the EU is not a party to the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, only states that themselves have ratified the Covenant and accepted the interstate complaint procedure can lodge a complaint against another state. So it, we are in the hands of individual states. But as to the question whether we have enough facts, I believe we have, since uh, the United States has, better than the UK, I would say, admitted the existence of certain elements of those surveillance programs. So we have the basic uh, facts as admitted by the US authorities. Furthermore, we know the provision of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which has been used as legal basis. And we know how vague and broad it is. It's incomprehensible for the average citizen to understand what will be the outcome of the application of that provision. We also know that uh, the provision has been administered by a secret court through secret case law, where the uh, participants to the proceedings are under strict gag orders. Uh, and we also know that both the congressional uh, oversight bodies in the U.S. and the FISA court itself have admitted that they have failed in exercising oversight. So I would say that the, the criterion of prescribed by law, law meeting the qualitative requirements posed by human rights treaties, that has been proven. So the, the, the surveillance architecture fall, fa fails already on the first ground, lack of legal basis. Thank you. Now a question from uh, Mrs. Sippel. Brigitte, your question. 
Ja, vielen Dank. Ich würde doch gerne noch mal nachhaken zu der Frage, ob auch die EU Beschwerde einlegen kann. Nämlich könnten wir denn dem ICCPR beitreten und dann Beschwerde einlegen? Das wäre ja noch mal ein neuer Schritt. Die zweite Frage ist, diese Verstöße gegen Artikel 17, der Eingriff in die Privatsphäre wird ja von den Staaten immer begründet mit äh, innerer Sicherheit, Terrorismus, vielen anderen Dingen. Und diese Dinge, diese Überwachungsmechanismen finden ja auch nicht erst seit gestern statt. Es gehört wahrscheinlich nicht zu Ihrer Tätigkeit. Aber haben Sie den Eindruck, dass diese Vorgehensweisen, können Sie dazu etwas sagen, ob diese Vorgehensweisen auch Einfluss haben auf die allgemeine Rechtsprechung in den einzelnen Staaten, dass das Einfluss hat auf die Wahrnehmung und Bedeutung von Grundrechten insgesamt, auch in anderen Verfahren? Und äh, sehen Sie daraus entstehend insgesamt eine Gefahr für den Bestand der Rechtsstaatlichkeit, wie wir sie bisher kennen in den einzelnen Staaten? Thank you. And a question from Mr. Andrew. You are. Uh, thank you, Professor, as well. Um, in your report from 2009 on the promotion and, uh, and protection of uh, human rights and uh, fundamental freedoms while uh, counter-terrorism, you highlighted an uh, erosion of the right of, to privacy in the fight against uh, terrorism through the use of surveillance uh, powers and new technologies. You underlined that these measures not only threaten the citizen right to pri privacy, but uh, they also have an impact on the freedom of movement, especially at borders. I would like I would like to, to, to ask you a question. Four years after, according to you, what recent development in the area of surveillance and uh, counter-terrorism still endanger our citizen right to free movement? And the second, would you assess the efficiency of the increase of the collection of information about the movement of the people regarding the objective of the counter-terrorism? And the last one is uh, what rigorous legal safeguards could be developed in order to minimize, to minimize risks to privacy generated by new policies in the area of border control, particularly in the current context, context of development of automated border control and the use of large-scale databases in the area of border management. Would these best practices that you elaborated in 2009 still be relevant in this context? Thank you. Okay, and then the final question is a supplementary from Axel Voss. Ja, entschuldigen Sie bitte, dass ich immer in, dass ich immer in Etappen ähm, wieder nachfrage. Ähm, nur die Frage ist hier, wenn Sie sagen, dass generell elektronische Überwachungseinrichtungen Artikel 17 verletzen, man aber auch zur Gefahrenabwehr oder für die Sicherheit, die nationale Sicherheit oder wie auch immer ja elektronische Überwachungseinrichtungen durchaus auch nutzt, wo ist denn hier die Abgrenzung in dem CCPR zwischen der des Hineingehens in, in die Privatsphäre einerseits und die Abgrenzung ähm, zur Abwendung einer Gefahr für die nationale Sicherheit oder überhaupt einer allgemeinen Gefahr. Thank you, Axel. And uh, Professor, do you want to make your final um, answer and then any conclusions you want to make? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Maybe I start with Mr. Voss. Um, Of course, um, countering terrorism or other forms of serious crime is a pressing social need, a legitimate interest which allows for restrictions also into the sphere of privacy. And you asked some sort of hypothetical, where could I draw then the line? Um, We, we can discuss the question of data retention at European level, where telecommunications providers and Internet providers have been obliged to maintain the metadata for between six months to 24 months. 
and then only through proper authorization processes, usually individual judicial decision, the authorities then get access to that data. That could be seen as a safe model. It has been controversial even in that form in Europe, particularly because some people say that 24 months is a very long time and we shouldn't have such long duration for data retention. Others say you cannot trust the companies to store it properly, that there will always be abuses which result in, in, in failures and hence privacy violations re resulting from the mere storing. But I, I think we have, we have chosen a method which is based on publicly available legislation, the Data Retention Directive and its national implementation, which gives much better foreseeability to individuals in Europe than is, for instance, the consequence of United States legislation, where we perhaps need to sharpen uh, also the uh, laws in Europe is then the authorization procedures. What level of individual suspicion is required in order that the police or the prosecutor can address that data? In the surveil project, we put a lot of emphasis on the, uh, on the institution of judicial authorization because that immediately lowers the fundamental rights intrusion under our scale. And that, of course, is a safe model um, building on, on the long tradition of judicial authorization in matters which uh, extend to uh, the sphere of privacy or otherwise result in interferences with fundamental rights. Uh, Mrs. Sippel asked whether the EU can accede to the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Unfortunately, not. The old UN Human Rights Treaties are, have been written so that only states can accede. The only exception so far is the recent Disability Convention, where for the first time the EU has been able to become a party to a United Nations Human Rights Treaty. The others would require amendment process, which is, of course, cumbersome, fully possible, but will take time. Then you had a broad question about the impact upon other cases and the threat to the rule of law. I think this is an important question um, in a matter which requires close attention from, uh, the, uh, from the legal profession, human rights, NGOs, and parliamentarians alike. Um, I think there is a grave danger that, that if it becomes publicly accepted that privacy is dead and there is no longer any expectation of privacy, then there can be a snowball or domino effect in relation to other fundamental rights as well. And therefore it's important that when this is the first case or the primary case where we are now confronted with new challenges posed by new technologies, that, that it, it receives the proper thorough attention uh, it requires also from the more general perspective of protecting other fundamental rights. Uh, Mr. Enshu had a series of questions of the um, interlinkage between privacy rights and freedom of movement, especially in relation to uh, new technological developments at borders and how freedom of movement is indirectly affected by new surveillance technologies or new uh, databases, etc., utilized towards sm smart or automatic borders. This is an important field of work which requires attention also in the broader surveillance context. It's just one of the many cases where uh, we can see that surveillance primarily affects the right to privacy, but then there are indirect effects, derivative effects in relation to many other human rights. They can be freedom of association, freedom of assembly, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, which often are indirectly affected. Um, one can speak of chilling effect. People don't dare to associate. People don't dare to express themselves freely, or they, don't, they fear to move. If, for instance, so-called metadata is so carefully tracked that every movement a person makes is traced so that one knows what religious institutions, what uh, clubs, 
what political organization the person visits regularly that, that will build the profile of, uh, of sensitive personal data, even if it's based on pure metadata. But you, you, you asked primarily about national borders, and I think we have a, f quite a alarming or at least bothering development ongoing in Europe because we have introduced the uh, biometric passports. And in many countries, the biometrics are not just in the passport, but they are collected into a national database, which is not a requirement coming from EU law, but that nevertheless has been the solution of many countries. It would be fully possible to verify a biometric passport simply by comparing the person and the passport, the living person and the passport, whether the biometric match, and there is no need for storage and creation of any database, but many countries have taken the step. And we see the function creep or mission creep now in the sense that when these databases have been created, a police authority or some other authority makes a point they would be extremely useful for some other purpose. So we have the erosion of general protections of privacy resulting from the introduction of uh, biometrics into the passport, which is a device for crossing national borders, but it's expanding to totally different areas of life uh, through, the, through the generation of databases and their subsequent use for totally different purposes. So I think there is much need for being alert and following the question of borders. Um, of, of course, a much broader question then is um, the uh, development of uh, so-called Fortress Europe and the difficulties people from other countries often fearing persecution have in coming to the EU area, but that touches upon many other dimensions, and the, here the technological means is just one little dimension of the overall question. Thank you, uh, Professor. You, you sort of finished that in a big can of worms that you were about to open. Thank you very much. Um, you've... Um, That is, that's probably the video conference starting. Um, thank you for finishing just as the video conference um, is about to start and is thankfully blocking me. Um, um, I just want to say thank you for your contribution. The recommendations in particular, the six recommendations, are going to be very useful um, to um, our shadow rapporteurs and me as the rapporteur in drafting this report, particularly some of the issues that you couldn't go into on detail at the German amending protocol and some of these other uh, recommendations that you make. This is all being uploaded now to the Libe website for colleagues who want to um, see it and it is very useful um, to look at. Um, and thank you for everyone um, being very succinct and for our session finishing so before time that we may not even be ready for the video conference. Um, are we ready? This is spookily going according to plan. Um, okay, so now we have um, with us, um, via video conference, Judge Bostan Zupancic from the European Court of Human Rights uh, to cover the case law of this court. I don't know if you can hear us. Can you hear us, Judge? Yes, I can hear you. That's great. Thank you. Uh, thank you very yes. much for your presence today. and. Um, uh, thank you for being with us, and um, you have the floor if you're ready to make your presentation for 10 minutes. Um, well, this is a very complex problem, legally speaking, of course, but primarily it is not the problem of the European law so much, and especially not of the law of the Convention. It is a problem of uh, American law, uh, Patriot Act on which the host and electronic surveillance and other forms of spying were based, would have to be analyzed by the American courts and in the end by the American Supreme Court. And they have the power to strike it down in case they need to find that it is unconstitutional, which it certainly is. Whether this is going to happen or not is a different story, of course. And it takes years before a case will come to the American Supreme Court, 
but eventually it will come, uh, probably, and then in that case the court will find what the problem is, which the problem is based on particular law, particular section of the Patriot Act and other legislation which is the basis for the problem that we are talking about. Then when it comes to European law or European Court of Human Rights, uh, the case of the European Court of Human Rights, uh, I must first make, make a disclaimer, of course, that I'm not speaking in the name of the court. I'm only speaking in my own personal name uh, as somebody who has been here for 15 years and who is to some extent informed of what is going on. Um, the aggrieved party in this case, if it were to happen, is of course one of the citizens of Germany, France, Italy, of any of the EU countries, or uh, countries concerned that have signed the European Convention of Human Rights, 47 countries, and that person would have to bring a case before the domestic courts, exhaust all the domestic remedies on the issue, and then bring it to the European Court of Human Rights, which again might take years to materialize. Um, in the European Court of Human Rights, of course, we never had a case of that kind of massive electronic surveillance of citizens. Um, uh, and, and of course, it's there, therefore very difficult to say what would happen, except that the country, the United Kingdom, France, Germany, any of the involved country who has collaborated with NSA on this problem would have to be or would have to be uh, a suit party would have to be involved as a as a defender in this particular case and then of course uh, then of course the question would be how would it defend itself um, in front of the European Court of Human Rights there is one doctrine which applies both in the United States and in the European Court of Human Rights which is called the doctrine of political question. Political question doctrine, uh, especially in the United States and Europe, in French law it's called acte de gouvernement, um, is a situation in which the courts, this would not be true of the European Court of Human Rights, the courts do not want to get involved with uh, uh, questions which, which, which entail national security. They don't want to get involved sometimes with questions which entail, which concern national defense. Um, and uh, it is possible, for example, that the American Supreme Court, if it came to that, would employ that doctrine. Uh, as I said, it's called the doctrine of uh, political question, political question doctrine. Um, in the European Court of Human Rights, this doctrine uh, was used under French name of Acte de Gouvernement, which is a very feeble doctrine, and I don't think it would be used here. Um, then the question is, of course, whether the citizen would succeed um, with, in front of the European Human, uh, Court of Human Rights, but more than anything else, I would like to say that he, the citizen, would be more likely to be successful in any real sense of the word before the domestic constitutional courts, typically the German, the Italian constitutional court, not so much the French Conseil Constitutionnel or, or the English uh, or the English Supreme Court that does not have the power to strike down a particular law or particular practice, probably based on some kind of law which is, which is unconstitutional. In other words, I would think that in principle this question is more a question of constitutionality of national law rather than constitutionality uh, in terms of the European conventionality, so to say, of the European Convention of Human Rights. Moreover, we don't have the power to strike down the law on which this kind of unacceptable massive surveillance is based, whereas national courts, of course, vis-a-vis -vis particular uh, agencies of the the national state would have that power, would have the power to do it. Um, when it comes to particular cases of 
the return of surveillance we don't have too many in, in the European court and mostly they are connected just like in American law with the um, in criminal procedure. In other words, the question would be whether the evidence uh, so collected vis-à-vis -a, -vis a particular suspect or defendant in a criminal case would be admissible or not. Uh, especially rich in this respect is the American constitutional law, which I used to have taught, so I know a little bit about it, uh, where the right to privacy, of course, is, is specifically uh, connected with the admissibility of evidence in criminal procedure. Uh, and that, uh, well, I should say perhaps to conclude a few words about the right to privacy. In the European connection, we have the so-called Persönlichkeitsrechten in German law, or we have the droit de personnalité in French law, which are protective of the individual's privacy. No such thing exists in the United Kingdom, uh, where I taught on this, or lectured on these questions recently. Um, and no such thing exists, of course, in the United States. The article by Justice Brandeis on privacy is a very important piece of legal writing, but when it comes to specific protection of individual uh, privacy, this cannot compare with the, with the, with the elaborate uh, system of privacy protection under the Persönlichkeitsrechten, uh, the rights of personality. This would be my opening remarks. I am ready for any questions if you so want, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Judge Spanchik, and uh, thank you for being so brief. It gives us a chance to ask uh, more questions. Of course, we have a, an Article 8 uh, case which we are discussing in our next uh, session, so uh, there is some overlap there too which we can bring into discussion. I am going to um, start with our um, shadow rapporteurs and we are going to ask individual questions and then put those individual questions to you um, for individual answer and then go to, to the rest of our yeah. members. First of all, um, from Mr Axel Voss of the um, EPP group. Mr Voss, your question. Vielen Dank. Vielen Dank auch für Ihre... Achso, darf ich auf Deutsch sprechen? Ja. Ähm, vielen Dank auch für Ihre Darlegungen. Ich hoffe, es wird entsprechend übersetzt. Ähm, Sie hatten als ähm, Feststellung gesagt, yes, dass, dass, es mehr, also, dass es mehr eine Frage des nationalen Rechts ist, wie man damit letztlich auch umgeht. Ähm, jetzt ist für mich nur die Frage, in einer globalisierten Welt, wo sich möglicherweise auch die Geheimdienste entsprechend globalisieren, ähm, was machen wir mit einer Umgehung solcher nationalen Rechte, wenn nämlich der eine Geheimdienst, weil er seine eigenen Leute nicht untersuchen darf, sich an den befreundeten anderen Geheimdienst wendet, der das wiederum darf und sich so die Informationen beschafft, ähm, würde ich als Umgehung dieser nationalen ähm, ja, Vorgaben sehen. Ähm, eine zweite Frage wäre, das hatte ich auch eben schon einmal gestellt, ist für Sie alleine das Speichern von Daten schon eine Verletzung von Persönlichkeitsrechten oder ist es nachher lediglich die Analyse, die Verwendung dieser Daten? Und ein, eine dritte Frage dazu, hatten Sie schon mal die Möglichkeit gehabt, mit einem Fall zu hantieren, wo es um Vorratsdatenspeicherung ging? Uh, thank you very much for the questions. Now, the storage of the data is just as problematic as, legally speaking, as the surveillance itself, because nobody has the right to uh, infringe on the privacy of the individual and store data about him uh, without his or her consent. Uh, that is clear. Uh, then, could you repeat the second question? 
inwieweit für Sie das Speichern von Daten alleine schon eine Beeinträchtigung der Persönlichkeitsrechte sein könnte? Oder lediglich, oder was heißt lediglich, aber oder eben die Verwendung oder Analyse ist dann eine Beeinträchtigung oder das Speichern für sich alleine gesehen auch schon? No, the, as I said, the storage alone is sufficient to constitute a violation because they, they, nobody has the right to infringe on your privacy uh, to the extent that they gather information on you which may or may not be used. However, in specific cases, uh, uh, especially as I said in the American constitutional law, in the specific cases, the problem comes to the surface when that data, these data, so to say, are used to, for, for example, convict a criminal suspect on whom this electronic surveillance has been uh, centered, has been focused. Um, then as far as the national systems are concerned, as I said, national systems are, in a sense, accomplices of the foreign surveillance system insofar as they ob obtain and use those data that are obtained in, uh, in an illegal uh, fashion. Now, what is illegal in the United States may not be illegal, well, what is legal, I'm sorry, in the United States may not be illegal in Germany or in France or in Italy, etc. Um, but in that respect, if the national security agencies are in cahoots, so to say, in, in connection with the with the uh, foreign agency, the individual, when it comes to European Court of Human Rights, may launch, may start an action against the uh, national agency, that is a particular state in which he or she is residing, or which he or she thinks has violated his rights. Um, and, then, and then, of course, the national courts are going to be the first obliged to react in this particular fashion. Judge uh, Sopranchik, I think uh, you didn't hear Mr. Voss's first and third question. Am I right? Is that correct? Maybe I have heard the third question. Uh, the first question I didn't understand if you could repeat it. Yeah. Axel, if you could repeat the first question. And th die erste Frage beschäftigte sich mit der, ähm, mit der Situation, dass man zwar, wenn Sie sagen, es ist mehr eine Frage des nationalen Rechts, dass im Rahmen der Globalisierung auch von Geheimdiensten natürlich durchaus auch der Austausch über Daten besteht, das, was der eine nicht machen darf, macht der andere und nimmt deshalb die Erkenntnisse des anderen sozusagen für sich dann. That's right. That's right. No, no, I understand that. I thought I, I sort of responded to that to some extent already, insofar as the case which might come before the European Court of Human Rights must first exhaust all domestic remedies in Germany, for example. And that, that necessarily means that the German Constitutional Court would have to pronounce itself on this particular question necessarily because the case cannot otherwise come to the European Court of Human Rights. European Court of Human Rights is a regional organization. And therefore, in a globalized world, if the problem comes from the United States, not from, not from one of the member countries, the situation is completely different. You cannot sue the United States in front of the European Court of Human Rights because they are not signatory to the Convention. Um, there is a very complex doctrine concerning Article 1 of the Convention, which talks about the, the question of whether the effective control of a particular uh, situation is such that it would involve the responsibility of the particular country. In other words, if the secret services of, of the United Kingdom collaborate with the uh, NSA or any of the foreign countries in this respect, the passive legitimacy, as it's called, as the, the, the standing to be sued on the part of the national state, in that case, United Kingdom, 
would be given. In other words, it would be possible to sue uh, United Kingdom insofar as it has collaborated with the American agency. On the one hand, on the other hand, the, 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 the national domestic remedies, all the legal means within the domestic system would have to be exhausted beforehand, before the case would ever come to the European Court of Human Rights, which in turn means that this case, before it would ever come to the European Court of Human Rights, would take years of domestic legislation, uh, litigation before it can reach us in Strasbourg. Okay, Judge Spanchik, I'm going to take the next question from Mrs. Intervelt, who is from the Audi Group. Yes, um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Judge, for your presentation. I have to say, um, and that's not your, your, um, you're not personally to blame for that, but I find this deeply depressing. If I weren't a politician, uh, and anyone who isn't a lawyer, just a regular citizen, would feel uh, citizens have no real legal protection, no real legal recourse, because even if officially such recourse would exist, uh, it is such a legal jungle that it is impossible to find your way around it. And ironically, just this week, uh, I will be in Luxembourg for a, a hearing of a, a council appeal case against me because I asked access to documents about, what, six years ago. Now, you know, I'm, I'm, I tend to be very uh, tenacious, but, you know, if you're a regular citizen and you want to defend your rights, then you know, basically you're lost. That's also what you're saying. What you said I found very shocking, you're probably right, that courts do not go near anything to do with national security. Um, and that is, you know, I, I get that feeling uh, too. And, well, you're, you're shaking your head. I hope you're going to say I got it all wrong. Um, but there is no effective, no effective legal protection for citizens' rights. Is, is that the, the conclusion? Okay, well, Judge, well, there is no effective right. It's rhetorical. Well, it's a rhetorical question. Okay, what's your answer to that? I don't know it's a, whether it's a rhetorical question or not, but what I mentioned was the political question doctrine, which applies primarily to the United States. In other words, I said that if the United States, the courts were to tackle that problem, it, it, it might be that they would say that this is a question of national security and that therefore they will not touch it. This is not true in Europe. As I said, the Act de Gouvernement doctrine in the European Court of Human Rights is a very feeble doctrine. Therefore, the court, the court would tackle, of course, such a problem. But I must say that for anybody coming from a particular country, United Kingdom, etc., Ireland, whatever, he or she must exhaust domestic remedies. Because we are a court of last resort, we are a, there is something called subsidiary doctrine, and we only deal with these questions once they come to us. And they will, of course, if you have a very active legal profession, it may, they will try to bring the court, the, the case, very soon and very fast before the courts. And then, of course, uh, after the exhaustion of those domestic remedies, the court will end up in the European Court of Human Rights. But it will take a few years. I have a question along those lines too, but I'm going to go to, I'll come back, we, we've, we're doing well with time, so I shouldn't say that, that's just going to encourage everyone, but um, we're doing quite well with time, so we can keep coming back, but um, next we go to Jan Albrecht, who, for you judges from the Green Group. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for um, being so open uh, also on the situation when it comes to the application of the European Convention of Human Rights. Um, I think that, I mean, our scope, what we are talking about here is not only with regard to NSA activities and infringements by third states authorities. Our scope is also with regard to authorities here in the European Union and in the member states, of course, of the European Union and therefore also in the member states of the conventions of the Council of Europe. Uh, and as you have signed, uh, of course, uh, there would be uh, a binding situation to the Convention and it would be open uh, to any citizen to get legal remedy uh, in front of domestic courts and as last resort in Strasbourg. Now, there has been 
the one or another case already in Strasbourg on uh, personal data on privacy in the past. One of it uh, was the case MARPA versus UK, where uh, it was said by the court, more or less a bit uh, shortened, that an investigation purely into the blue without having uh, uh, um, a suspicion vis-a-vis -vis the subject is not compatible with the right to privacy. And I would like to ask you how you stand to this judgment. Is that still applying? And uh, would you feel personally also in, in your situation as a uh, judge um, see that the collection and or analysis of metadata with regard to email blanketly of users would be anyhow justifiable under the right to privacy or is that going beyond the proportionality uh, written out also by your court? It's going beyond any kind of proportionality, uh, but what you refer to is the so-called doctrine of probable cause. In a criminal procedure situation, in order to be able to invade the privacy of the particular suspect, criminal defendant, future criminal defendant, in order to listen and electronically survey him, you have to have a reasonable suspicion or probable cause uh, in order to be able to invade his privacy, uh, which means that, of course, in situations where there is no such suspicion, such invasion would uh, for sure I be un unacceptable. In other words, one must distinguish situations where particular individuals are suspects in a particular criminal procedure context. And in this respect, the individual is a victim of surveillance if, if, if the probable cause against him does not obtain. If it does obtain, if it doesn't obtain, and the evidence is therefore thereafter admitted in a criminal trial, that evidence is, can may be excluded from, especially if you have a jury trial, the evidence may be excluded or in other situations, the courts will not be able to refer to it in their reasoning out of the judgment. But that's a specific context of criminal procedure. Here we are not dealing with that. Here we are dealing with electronic surveillance on a massive scale, metadata, etc., 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 which have no probable cause and no reasonable suspicion, and therefore they are, would be a priori uh, open to attack in the courts and would be utterly unacceptable. Um, what, what they, however, what the national courts, let's say typically German constitutional court, can do is they can strike down the law, as I said before, on which such electronic surveillance is based in the country. European court cannot do that. European court has, can only give damages for the uh, violation of the right to privacy, and those damages typically would have to be paid by the national state rather than anybody judge, else. Judge, can I ask Jan Naubrecht to come back in, please? Jan. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, th thank you very much. Uh, I think that was clear. Uh, now, uh, my um, follow-up question to that would be, um, in most of these cases of mass surveillance, um, possible citizens, possible infringements to citizens are not uh, visible or possibly to be proved by the concerned citizen of uh, con conventions member state. So um, how should I go to a domestic court if there's no opportunity for me as a citizen of any convention member state uh, and prove that my rights are possibly infringed or that my rights, that there are uh, evidence for an infringement, 
uh, if there's no transparency or in opposition, rules on secrecy, obviously rules on secrecy which we have not really voted on, I don't know, uh, forbidding that. Uh, this is somehow a vicious circle where I would like to know your answer as a judge of the court of the last resort, how to deal with it if there is a loss of rule of law, a loss of fair uh, trial of my right to a judge in a convention member state, isn't there also or shouldn't there also be a possibility to access the Strasbourg court, uh, court jurisprudence? Thank you very much. Yes, very interesting question. Your question concerns the active standing, as it's called in law, to sue in a situation where you cannot be certain, not positively certain, although it is probable, that you have been the victim of electronic surveillance, uh, uh, etc. Um, this standing to sue, or it's called in legitimatio activa, is called in law, is possible when you have shown to the court, as you said, that you are the victim specifically of that electronic surveillance. But there are situations in our case law where, where uh, the victim status was not apparent, was not in completely uh, obvious, but under the particular law of the country, the person might at any, at any moment become a, this is the so-called sodomy cases, might at any, at any moment become a victim of, 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 of uh, prosecution in situations where the homosexual practices were, in, were, 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 were prescribed by law. Um, and therefore, the, sometimes it is not necessary that you are directly already affected by the practices which are not acceptable, I mean by uh, electronic surveillance. Uh, you, it is enough that you show that you, have, you are probably the victim of that kind of surveillance because uh, everybody else is. And that is a notorious fact so far, and therefore it is not necessarily that, necessary that you would show specifically that you are the victim. Thank you very much, Judge, for coming back. Um, I'm going to uh, now go to the members, um, if they have any questions. We have, no, do we have any questions, colleagues? No. no. No further questions. Uh, my uh, question, in fact, Judge, is really I wanted to keep it for the next session. I know that Professor Korf also is, is dying to, to come in. Um, and my, my question actually was, uh, I'm uh, from the UK, and uh, my question was, in fact, about Article 10 and Article 8 and this court of last, this um, position of last resort, and it was actually a, a more philosophical question about how people are feeling that their domestic legal framework is not sufficient and they want to see the ECHR as a, um, as a court which protects freedom of expression. And we now have, as you know, I mean, I think perhaps if you answer this, I mean, this pr probably I want to keep this for the next session. We have an Article 8 case now um, which is going to the court. And my, my question is um, how you perceive now the European Courts of Human Rights in this position, because um, increasingly in the UK, people are not seeing remedies at domestic level. They just see um, a political deficit as well as a judicial deficit. They don't see the, the point of taking a case. They also see it as too expensive. Legal aid is not available. Um, so we don't have the kind of jurisprudence developing. And I would like to know your opinion on this. And also you have this extraordinary situation where journalists who um, would not really want to defend the ECHR, and you know that there's a movement for us to leave um, the ECHR, but now suddenly um, this is becoming, people want to stay in it post Leveson, as you probably noticed, which I think is a paradoxical position. I'm not going to make any other comments. 
but it would be interesting to know what you think um, uh, of that situation, because I think uh, we, we have a deficit occurring on national jurisprudence in our, in our country. Um, that's, that's a question I really wanted to keep for, um, for other colleagues, but um, it would be interesting to know your point of view on this. You have, you have a deficit concerning what? Domestic remedies. Uh, in the UK. Um, so, for example, as Mr. Albrecht said, if you want a domestic remedy um, in a member state like the UK, it's actually very difficult. You're not going to get legal aid. You're not going to be able to, to, uh, to take um, a case very, uh, uh, very efficiently. The Article 8 case, which has been taken, of course, is a, you know, is a massive fundraising effort that is being taken by a number of organisations. And if you, if you are, if you're the victim of um, surveillance in the UK, it's very difficult as a indiv private individual to take such a case, and we've seen this um, uh, illustrated during the Leveson inquiry. So I just wanted your opinion and what you think um, is, is now the perception of the European Court of Human Rights, which is now seen as a, a kind of saviour um, of freedom of expression all of a sudden from some people who actually wanted us to leave the European Court of Human Rights. And as you know, there is a movement for the UK to leave. Um. Uh, yes, well, this is a fundamental position of the European Court of Human Rights and of the Convention, that the subsidiary role of the European Court comes into play only after the domestic remedies have been exhausted. But to take a more cynical view of that, if you want, well, it's not really cynical, but it's a practical view of that is that if the domestic remedies are not readily available, then it's so much easier to exhaust them. In other words, yes, you have to push the case through all the instances before you can come to the European Court of Human Rights, but you don't have to be successful. On the contrary, you must not be successful in order for the European Court to come into play. And therefore, um, I would not want to comment on this very delicate question of uh, uh, the adherence of the UK to the Convention, etc., etc. But when it comes to privacy protection in the United States, in the United Kingdom, it is absolutely true that the droit uh, de personnalité, the personnalité direct, don't exist in the same sense. Uh, and as I said, I gave a lecture in London on that in about three, four months ago, and the, it became apparent during the discussion that they have read the Brandeis article, for example, which I mentioned before, but they don't have the domestic means, exactly as you say, to push the case uh, and succeed in the domestic context. But then, all the more so, if they don't succeed, do they, can they bring the case to the European Court of Human Rights? Thank you very much, yeah. and thank you, um, Spanchik, for your presence here today and for your presentation. It's very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Okay, and now we go on to our third speaker in this so session. Yeah. Okay, so you can go to the slides. Okay, and this is the um, this is the third session or the third speaker, and this is covering EU law, and it's Professor Doi Korf, um, who's been professor of international law at London Metropolitan University since 2002, and he specialised in human rights and data protection. Um, professor Korf is known to many of us, and he's going to. Um, fulfill this EU section, which is uh, which is the big bit. So, without further ado, Professor Korf. Yes, thank you very much, and, and thank you to the committee for inviting me here. Uh, it's a very important session. Um, as I was indeed reminded, because uh, many of the other sessions have dealt with uh, uh, perhaps more the political issues and the practical and technical issues, it is really important for the committee to move this to the legal level as well. Um, I hope I can add a few points um, to Judge Supanchich's um, comments. Um, in being a judge, he's perhaps more of an angel um, uh, and can say a bit less than uh, fools like me can rush in to say um, about the convention. Um, I may 
perhaps even start right at the beginning with a comment on this exhaustion issue that um, Jan Albert um, picked up. Um, it is settled case law in Strasbourg that if there is no effective remedy available, you do not have to exhaust the, the, the either non-available or not effective remedy. And indeed, if there is something called an administrative practice, you don't have exhaust, uh, to have exhaust to domestic remedies. So there are definitely possibilities, and Nick Pickles will no doubt um, uh, add more to that uh, on that score. Um, I was told that if I want to make kudos with this committee, I have to stick to my 10 minutes, given that we got a bit of extra time, I might squeeze it a little bit. Um, I have okay, submitted... That, that was the pre-meeting. <laughs> I, I will have to try... Yeah, this, oh, this is the long version, is it, that they've put up? I was hoping for the short version, but um, what I have given you um, uh, is a number of... a note I wrote in August... Uh, which deals with the issues in a sort of textual way. I have also um, submitted uh, something called the EDRI 3 submission on surveillance, which I helped to draft, um, which deals with these issues perhaps in a more activist uh, sort of way, as well as two sets of slides, the long version and the short version. Um, um, unfortunately, you have the long version in front of you, but I'll try and skip through it fairly quickly even so. Um, mostly because I don't want to tread on what other people have already said. So let me start very quickly. I've got a number of, um, as you can see, this is also an unfinalized version, but it doesn't matter. You can find everything in due course on, on the net. I'm going to talk about the ECHR requirements, the way the ECHR requirements are reflected in EU law, um, the general international data protection requirements in the EU is, of course, very important, and the international legal requirements, which Professor Scheinin has covered, but I'll just add a few comments to it. And then I will come to the final, it's a preliminary issue in legal terms, but it's a very important one. I've left it to the end. Uh, and that is about the competence uh, of the EU with regard to national security and national states. And I'm sure the committee will find that an important topic, and that's what I'll focus on. Very quickly, um, uh, there is, in fact, a considerable amount of case law in Strasbourg on surveillance, going back to the class judgment, but in particular I would draw the attention of the committee to the Weber and Savaria judgment against Germany and to compare that with Liberty and others against the UK. From that you can deduce quite a clear set of principles that states should adhere to in terms of the European Convention of Human Rights in conducting surveillance. I have summarized those, for those who want to have the paperwork there, on page six of the note that I submitted in August. So one page summary, which I hope you will find useful. Um, what I add there as well is that states have a positive obligation. Well, they have an obligation not to carry out um, improper surveillance to start with. They also have a positive obligation um, to prevent other states from spying on their citizens. And, of course, they shouldn't collude in illegal surveillance by third states either. Um, and also to add to what Professor Scheinin has also said, it is um, modern international law generally that states should comply with their international human rights requirements also when they're acting in relation to people outside their territory. And that has been very well established by the court. The court has said very clearly States should not be allowed to do things uh, on the territory of other state parties that they are not allowed to do at home. That makes good common sense, and I think it's well, something to, rem to remember. There are also very clear procedural requirements in the European Convention on Human Rights. There must be very strict control of surveillance. There must be strict time limits. There must be strict purpose limitation spelled out in the law, um, and all that is not uh, in existence in the systems that we have seen in the United Kingdom. And uh, Eric Pickles will no doubt be able to, uh, and Nick Pickles will be able to say more about it. I'm giving you the reference to the case that he will present later on. Um, this is the bit about the extraterritorial application. I've already mentioned that. And of course, the, um, the European Convention of Human Rights is in substance uh, very similar to the Charter of Fundamental Rights. The Charter of Fundamental Rights, if anything, takes it slightly forward. It has a specific sui generis right of data protection, so it underlines the importance of data protection in EU law. I think when you look at the case law of the court, there's no case law of the court on the national security exemption. I'll come to that later. Um, but if you look at the Sabam ruling, the court was very critical of generalized monitoring of people, 
um, even if it's for a legitimate aim, and it was very strict in applying the proportionality system. And I would expect the court in Luxembourg to apply those same principles if a case uh, with regard to national security uh, surveillance came before it. Um, here you have the, the judgment in Sabam on that slide. I hope everybody here is aware of the general data protection principles and I don't have to spell them out. Um, processing of data has to be fair, it has to be transparent, it has to serve a lawful purpose, it has to have a proper legal basis, um, there must be restrictions on transported data flows, people must be given rights. We all know those principles. All I can say is the kind of surveillance that we now know has taken place from the United Kingdom in particular, but it looks like there are other European states that have not behaved well either, is utterly incompatible with the most fundamental data protection principles in Europe. Absolutely, utterly, fundamentally in conflict with the most basic European human rights and data protection principles. And I put that a bit cl uh, clearer in the next um, uh, in, in the next slide, uh, with reference, by the way, to um, uh, an interesting study on the views of the different national courts on data retention. And I think it's important to look at that. If data retention is dubious, and I find it extremely dubious, then mass surveillance and data mining is beyond the pale. Finally, on that data protection issue, um, something, this is, I'm afraid, a hobby horse of mine, but uh, when you do um, data mining on the basis of keyword searches, with artificial intelligence being used to make computers learn to come up with more and more sophisticated outcomes of those searches, you're effectively uh, instituting profiling. Profiles, I've written it in, in other contexts, are dangerous, inherently dangerous by themselves, especially if you're looking for very rare phenomena like terrorists, let alone potential terrorists, or people who may become terrorists. You're inevitably going to end up with massive amounts of false negatives and false positives that are going to destroy the, the, the lives of, of many people. It is uh, something that really should be, should be cautioned against in the context of the general data protection regulation, but also in this particular context of data mining for, for national security purposes. Uh, I've given an example here from um, the schleswig holstein uh, law on national security uh, monitoring, uh, just to show one example of how you can have laws that are restrictive and that are certainly on the face of it human rights compliant. And if what you can see here is very clear, a clear definition of the purpose, what can be, or for what purposes surveillance can be used. And I'll come back to that in a minute when I talk about the national security exemption. Um, a clear um, requirement that activities must be targeted, and I think Jan Albrecht again asked a question about that. There have to be specific evidence for specific targets. The final point, it has to be based on real, factual, individualized evidence. Suspicion evidence, it doesn't of course have to be sufficient to convict, but sufficient evidence to, to uh, target individuals rather than broad sweeping surveillance of everybody just in case somebody might possibly in the future become a terrorist or become some kind of subversive in some other way. That is the opposite of the rule of law. Finally, just to, um, to confirm everything that Martin um, already said, these principles that are applied in, in Europe are identical in, in most respects to the ones that are applied by the Human Rights Committee under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. The need for a clear and a specific foreseeable law, of course, published law, no secret courts. Um, the need for clear uh, legitimate aim, the clear for necessity and for proportionality. On those principles, the UN principles and the European principles are identical. Equally on the point that non-nationals should be given equal protection to nationals. Equally on the question that actions outside a, con uh, a state's territory are equally subject to the, data, the, the human rights uh, requirements of the ICCPR or the European Convention of Human Rights. The United States is a party to the ICCPR 
Um, I totally agree with uh, Martin Scheinin that it would be essential to bring an interstate case in this global threat to um, everybody's fundamental rights in an in interconnected uh, new world. And by the way, um, if states act outside their territory, that also violates the sovereignty of, um, of those other territories. And that's a principle that goes back hundreds of years, most clearly stated in, um, in the Lotus case by the Permanent Court for International Justice in 1927. And I think I've got the quote here. Uh, I haven't got the actual quote, but it's the first and most holy principle of international law is that you do not exercise your power on the territory of, or dare I say it, with regard to the citizens of another state. So states act also act in, in violation of general principles of public international law, and Vivian Redding, by the way, confirmed that as well. In that context, one particular issue, there is a proposal in Strasbourg that uh, a new additional protocol be added to the Cybercrime Convention that would legalize this um, cross-border gathering of evidence by uh, law enforcement and possibly also national security agencies. Uh, Peter Hustings has said before this very committee, everything must be done to stop that additional protocol, and I totally and fully endorse him in that view. Now let me come to the point that I really wanted to come to. I hope I have quickly enough come over everybody else's crowd, and that is the national security exemption in the, uh, in the treaties. Um, if you read the Article 4.2, it very simply says national security remains the sole responsibility of each member state. If you read that on its face, it says this is totally for the states to sort out, no competence whatsoever for the political organs, the charter doesn't apply because it's EU law, and um, the Court of Justice has no uh, competence. That is a wild overstatement of the legal position, and I really think it's important for the committee to realize that. The first question uh, is that there are a whole range of competences within EU law on matters like internal security, and then I'm talking about the internal security of the Union. The, uh, under the common foreign security policy, the Union also have competences in relation to international peace and security. And of course, there are massive competences within justice and home affairs uh, in relation to terrorism and serious crime. You cannot separate those other matters from national security of the individual member states. And it is a matter of general treaty law general treaty law, I'm quoting the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, that states may not act in a way that undermines their treaty obligations. What that means is that the United Kingdom cannot act in relation to national security matters in a way that undermines the, the matters that are within EU competence in relation to internal security and in relation to international security and in relation to the fight against terrorism and serious organized crime. The UK and other states that spy on citizens of other countries have a duty to act in relation to their national security uh, interests in a manner that is compatible with their obligations under the treaties generally. And indeed that goes also in, with regard to anything that might affect the fundamental rights and freedoms, including the typical European freedoms, um, under the treaties more generally. That's one issue. So there, there is a um, uh, competence of the committee and of the EU generally to check whether the actions by the United Kingdom in particular are compatible with its obligations under the treaties in these other fields. And there was, of course, also the fundamental question of what constitutes national security. Now we have seen that the, um, the United States in particular under FISA has an extremely broad definition of what the NSA can do. It's not really limited to national security as anybody can reasonably understand it. It, it, it. They can hoover up any data that might in any way be useful or relevant or of interest in relation to the United States international relations. It can include commercial spying, it can include political spying on totally, totally um, uh, non-violent uh, political groups such as Big Brother Watch or Org or any of the other groups that I, um, I work with, but also environmental groups or uh, gay rights groups or anything uh, they, they fancy. 
the United, the United Kingdom's definition is also deficient. In fact, there is no definition of national security in UK law. The courts have refused to entertain it all. They said it, it's much broader than it used to be. It used to be a threat to the independence and the existence of the state. But now it can also include pandemics, environmental threats, and there has even been a case in which um, the United Kingdom refused to continue a case, a, a very serious bribery case in the UK courts because it threatened the good relations with the country where the bribery took place. And it said that too, having good relations with bad countries is also part of national security. So the concept of national security in UK law is much too wide. Uh, Professor Scheinin, in some of his submissions, has given some interesting definitions uh, in the UN instruments. I want to mention the, um, uh, the Johannesburg Principles, which were drafted by um, Article 19, but they have been endorsed by uh, a range of political bodies, I think including at the Council of Europe and at the UN. And it has a very restrictive definition, as you can see here, uh, of national security. It is to protect the country's existence or its territorial integrity against the use or threat of force or its capacity to respond to, respond to the uh, threat or use of force. It is not legitimate to use national security powers to protect the government from embarrassment or exposure of wrongdoing, or to conceal information about the functioning of its institutions, and I might add, or to get some advantage in diplomatic negotiations or to give advantage to um, companies from that country. It is important to have a narrow definition. Since this term, national security, is used in Article 4.2 of the Treaty on European Union, it is a legal concept within EU law. And the Court of Justice in Luxembourg even if it cannot uh, have that much, I'll come to that in a second, that much uh, jurisdiction about states' action in that field, does have the right to interpret this legal term in a way that is compatible with the treaties and with fundamental rights. And I would urge this committee to look at that. Uh, these are these broad definitions elsewhere. So let me come to my general conclusions about EU competence. I believe that the EU institutions are legally allowed to assess within their own competences whether the UK surveillance programs and its data exchanges and its cooperation with the USA are limited to the protection of national security in the sense in which that term must be understood in international and EU law. It's a legal question. Even if the UK's actions are limited to national security as properly understood, there is still the question, as I said, of whether those actions don't undermine the competences of the EU, either joint competences or sole competences of the EU, in relation to internal security, international security, or the fight against terrorism and, and serious crime. Of course, if this committee or the court were to find that the actions of the United Kingdom and other states were not limited to national security as properly understood, then that would not be covered by the exemption in Article 4.2, and that means that those extra exemption activities would be fully uh, within the competence of this committee and of the EU to assess. And that, of course, includes in particular whether it's compatible with data protection uh, rights and principles. And as far as the U.S. concerned, uh, the, this committee and uh, the EU generally has the competence to check whether the, EA, the USA is acting in contravention of the EU's data protection rules in any activity carried out in the EU. And we know that EU data protection rules have uh, applied to um, uh, non-EU-based controllers in certain respects. And, of course, especially with regard to the safe harbor and the PNR and SWIFT agreements, I can say, I believe anybody can say, and certainly anybody who heard Connolly's presentation to this committee, the safe harbor is the most unsafe harbor you could possibly wish to, to steer your ship into. I think I will leave it at this. I hope I've more or less kept, kept my time. Uh, I just want to say at the end I agree with uh, Peter Huston, my compatriot, that we are facing an existential challenge to our fundamental rights and liberties. This is not some kind of trivial issue. We are talking about in an interconnected age of something that touches the very core, Professor Scheidin said it as well, the very core of our right uh, of autonomy in, in a free and democratic society. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Professor Korf. I think we have declared uh, safe harbour unsafe on this committee. That's one thing we've done. Um, your presentation is, is being uploaded, the full presentation is being uploaded on the Libe website. Um, I also should mention, I've had a couple of messages from uh, some of our members who have very compelling reasons for not being here and wanted to be here and wanted me to mention to all the speakers um, uh, that they um, are very saddened that they couldn't be here and they wanted to uh, send their appreciation um, for your presentations. Um, can we now just open the floor to, first of all, to Jan Albrecht uh, for his first question? Yeah, thank you very much, and uh, thank you also for outlining uh, the cases uh, in, in detail, because I think that obviously uh, there is a clear infringement to the Convention's uh, um, text or legal framework, and um, my question, therefore, would be, as you also at the beginning lined out the way how uh, this uh, can be addressed for individuals, uh, do you see also um, a possibility for uh, member states and institutions to uh, point out infringements uh, or to go to a Strasbourg court? Uh, if yes, I would be very interested in uh, listening about that. Uh, and also, if you see that, for example, in the Council of Europe, there's also in, in some way uh, a need for political debate on the massive infringement, obviously, of the uh, framework of the Council of Europe and its treaties, um, and in which way uh, governments uh, carrying these treaties should care about uh, these laws to be enforced. So also from an international law perspective, what are the possibilities uh, for, for diplomacy on that with regard to the infringements of this convention? Do you want to answer that one first, and then I'll go. Then I'll go on next to Mrs. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a good um, broad issue. Uh, let me let me start just going back a little bit again with um, what Judge Supanchi said about the court in Strasbourg not being able to change to order the changes of law the way the German Constitutional Court can suspend parts of law. Um, that, that, that is a bit too easy to put it like that. Um, in many, many countries in Europe, the laws have changed because of judgments in Strasbourg and have had to be changed. And after all, there is an implementation mechanism of the um, judgments in Strasbourg through the Committee of Ministers, slightly odd, but um, that has actually improved over the years. So if there is a finding in Strasbourg that a particular activity of a state violates the convention, then the state is obliged to take remedial action. And if the activity is squarely based on its national law, it will have to change the law. Um, and otherwise, it won't come off the agenda of the Committee of Ministers. So um, I, I do think there are possibilities there. In, within Europe, um, uh, the possibility of um, having some issues looked at in Luxembourg is perhaps more complex than the ones of actually getting things to Strasbourg. Because it, since... Um, in many respects, there are no adequate remedies available, certainly with regard to what we've now learned about GCHQ in, in the UK. I think it is obvious that the, the, you know, the supervisory mechanisms in the UK were inadequate because they didn't stop this obvious breach of the convention. So there is no effective remedy, um, and therefore you can go straight to Strasbourg, and therefore Strasbourg could deal with this fairly quickly, and it could be before the Committee of Ministers fairly quickly. On top of that, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe has called, I think it's been referred to the Legal Affairs Committee, for an Article 52 inquiry by the Secretary General, um, which could be wider and could involve other states as well. I believe it is very useful, would be very useful to have such an inquiry. I would hope that the uh, Council of Europe Commissioner for Human Rights would use his power to intervene in such a case, which he's never done. Um, and that would, I think, create an enormous amount of momentum at the Strasbourg level for trying to come up with ways of reconciling legitimate interests of the state in protecting its national security with its fundamental requirements under the convention. Something on the lines of the Schleswig-Holstein uh, law that I've pointed out, just an example, but it is so much better to read what it says there. Clear um, uh, 
uh, factual evidence, targeted surveillance, good superv supervisory mechanisms, good parliamentary control. All those, all those elements are there. And I would hope that these kind of measures would do it. I also fully endorse Professor Scheinin's call for an interstate case uh, under the ICCPR. Uh, and I, I think that the one thing would be to, to look for the right kind of state. One problem, if you want a bit of advice there, um, many years ago uh, I looked at the interstate complaints against Turkey over massive um, torture and other human rights violations. And it was hugely problematic that there were something like five or seven states involved in the interstate case. Um, it might be better to have one country bringing the interstate case with the other countries taking a bit of a backseat rather than having um, three or four or five ministries, uh, foreign ministries involved in a complex case like that. Um, so that, that would be one tip. But I would very much endorse the ICCPR route and it, that does not stand in the way of um, uh, the interstate case in the UK as well, of course. Plus Article 52 inquiry by the Secretary General of the, of the Council of Europe. And exploring the possibilities of some Luxembourg action, but I think you know better than I do there how complex that is. Thank you very much. Mrs. Sippel. Oh, sorry, Ariane, you want to come back quickly? I, I'm sorry, I don't, don't want to take uh, the other's times, but as we are a lit, little cozy around, uh, I think it should be possible. Um, just because I, I have something in my mind which is also linked to the question of international law, and as you are uh, a very well-known international law uh, expert, I would like to ask it to you. Um, in my view, um, we have to do also, we have to deal also with uh, attacks on sovereignty of states. Obviously, there was a huge attack by British authorities on the sovereignty of Belgium. Obviously, there are other attacks going on also, United States, vis-a-vis uh, -vis European states or other states. Uh, I don't know, but my impression is that we are dealing with the erosion of sovereignty and I cannot remember any other case of that extent in uh, sovereign uh, or infringements, international sovereignty being accepted by the particular cases in that way. Uh, so my question would be if you would share that view. And the second question is, if we talk about international law, if states do so, then it becomes accepted. So um, this will be uh, somehow the international law of the future. And with regard to the activity of some members, uh, some member states, I would say, some states uh, in, in our global society which are not following the basis of rule of law and democracy as uh, OECD countries or Council of Europe countries are doing, uh, what do you think, think this will uh, have an impact for the international law environment which have, we have built as democratic states for the last uh, decades. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, but there, there, would, there might be possibilities to take a case to the International Court of Justice in The Hague, of course, on a pure sovereignty basis. Um, but of course, you, you generally need the consensus of both states concerned. One um, positive note, um, if, if enough states object to this kind of practice, then you will not create customary international law. So um, I would hope an awful lot of states make clear that they are not happy about this practice and then you will stop the creation of a customary norm um, uh, on the basis of what some rogue states, as I almost call them, are now up to in this, in this respect. Uh, but what if not? That's well, the question. Well, one, one thing is, since, since the Second World War, before the Second World War, the Secret Services did whatever they like anyway, they, 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 even the existence wasn't, um, wasn't given free. Since the Second World War, I have apparently, and there have been the actual inquiry of Parliament a few years ago, so ten, ten years ago already, um, n Secret Services, national security agencies, have never properly been brought within the rule of law. 
I think that is, that is the, the really broadest background that you have here. That, within the Cold War, that was broadly accepted because they only dealt with spies and these things in, in the dark outer edges of society anyway. With terrorism, national security, secret surveillance issues have started to permeate into ordinary lives. The difference between fighting crime and fighting threats against the state are being blurred. Uh, that's one of the greatest dangers that is brought about by terrorism, which is the, the, the anti-terrorist reaction of bringing the, the, the secret surveillance state into being, into the ordinary parts of life. I think if you want to really go back to base, all the treaties and all the international agreements that are in place on the basis of which all these, these, this globalization, uh, uh, Mr. Voss mentioned it, is taking place, this cooperation between intelligence agencies, that must be reviewed. And I believe you have, of course, the Five Eyes, you have the UK-USA Treaty, which is extended to the other English-speaking countries. You have NATO treaties. I have not seen them. I know that a lot, big parts of them are, are, um, uh, are secret. There are treaties between, I think, even Germany and, and other states that nobody knows the details of. Um, I think in a state under the rule of law, there should be no such thing as secret treaties. Um, everything must be based on the very least on public, foreseeable, clear rules that have democratic endorse, uh, endorsement in parliaments. And we can talk about where the limits lie, but we have for too long lived in a situation where nobody even tried to draw the limits. I think that's what Hustings was saying, is that it's time to draw the line. Uh, Mr. Sippel. Ja, vielen Dank. Wir haben ja diese Debatte begonnen angesichts von massiven Datensammlungen der USA und wir haben heute gehört, dass diese Sammlungen sehr wohl gegen internationale Vereinbarungen verstoßen, unsere Mitgliedstaaten sich aber nicht dagegen wehren. Und äh, Sie haben eben darauf hingewiesen, dass mindestens auf dem Papier die Situation in Europa besser ist. Erste Frage, ist sie nur auf dem Papier besser und ist das der Grund, warum unsere Mitgliedstaaten keine Beschwerde einlegen, weil dann könnten ja auch eigene Fehler auffallen. Zweitens, die Definition in den Verträgen zur nationalen Sicherheit als alleinige Verantwortung der Mitgliedstaaten. Ich habe mich da schon immer darüber gewundert, weil nationale Sicherheit, dazu gehört ja nach Aussage unserer Mitgliedstaaten auch der Kampf gegen den Terrorismus. Und zum Kampf gegen den Terrorismus arbeiten Staaten und Geheimdienste ja durchaus zusammen. Sie tauschen Informationen aus. Von daher würde ich erwarten und würde gerne Ihre Stellungnahme dazu hören, dass hier sehr wohl auch ein europäischer Aspekt durchaus enthalten ist in der Frage der nationalen Sicherheit. Und eine letzte Frage. Ja, es gibt in mindestens einigen Mitgliedstaaten Kontrollgremien, Mechanismen, die aber auch nicht immer gut funktionieren. Frage mindestens dann, wenn ich eine europäische Zuständigkeit auch für nationale Sicherheit feststelle, habe ich dann auch die Möglichkeit, die Mitgliedstaaten da, wo Erkenntnisse vorliegen, aufzufordern, ihre Regeln der Transparenz und Verhältnismäßigkeit, was auch die Arbeit der Geheimdienste angeht, zu verbessern. Ja, auf die Professor Kroff, uh, sorry, finish the translation. Yeah. Professor Kroff, could I just add a, course, yes. a, a one question for me and Please. then ask you to answer the... I will. Gladly. Sorry, I'll, I'll add a question and then ask you just to do a final conclusion. Yep. Um, I just wanted to ask you, um, to depart from the question I was going to ask you, about what you said about the national security exemption and also to pick up on what... Um, Jan Albrecht was saying about the Belgacom case again. One of the big difficulties we face um, in this inquiry, one of the many difficulties, is this whole issue. Um, we had this ad hoc hearing on, obviously, Belgacom, one member state allegedly um, spying on another member state. Now, if in the post-war situation you don't have complete oversight of intelligence activities and you have complete denials that anything is happening, and yet in the treaties it also says 
that, you know, as you said, I think you said it's a wild overstatement to say that there's a national security exemption. I mean, how, w how do you find your way through this? I mean, in the UK example, for example, there's an unwritten constitution. So the idea that you're ever going to have a statement of this is what, what it says constitutionally on secret services is going to be a very difficult position to, to get to. But what, you know, how do you map your way through this situation where um, you have allegations from one member state to another within the EU context, um, and then you know, you're left with a situation where uh, serious allegations are made, but um, you can hide within um, the context of the national, first of all, the national security exemption, and then you can hide, um, of course, with just general, it's a general allegation. Um, and yet both are EU member states. I mean, it's a very difficult one for EU citizens to understand. It's a difficult one for us with an EU inquiry to understand. And you say it's a wild overstatement because we're also dealing with Europol and so many internal security um, ad hoc situations. So it's in an interesting point. I will try and deal with all the questions. Ich werde erst mal versuchen, Ihre äh, Fragen zu beantworten. Ähm, Sie sagen da, äh, das war interessant, vor, vor einigen Monaten haben die, äh, die Amerikaner gesagt, warum werden wir immer beschuldigt, dass es hier bei uns so schlecht ist, bei euch in Europa ist es eigentlich noch schlimmer. Ja? Und ich weiß jetzt eigentlich, war, warum die das sagten. Die wussten da schon einiges, was wir nicht gewusst haben. Ähm, also das ist, das ist an sich schon interessant. Es ist natürlich wahr, dass es in Europa auf Papier besser ist. Wir haben eine Menschenrechtskonvention und die trifft zu. Da gibt es keine Ausnahme für nationale Sicherheit. Also da, die, die soll zutreffen. Da ist natürlich noch die Frage, ja, was passiert dann, wenn, wenn der nicht eingehalten wird? Na ja gut, dann haben wir die, 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 die Gerichtshofe in jedem Staat, die sollten das aufrecht behalten, entweder unter der nationalen äh, Verfassung und, und oder unter der Menschenrechtskonvention und wenn das noch nicht gelingt, kann man nach Straßburg. Ähm, von mich aus, die Prinzipien sind ziemlich klar, die sind nicht so schlecht, so, so schlimm anzuwenden von, von Gerichtshofen, das, das, das sollte Richter schon können, so schlimm ist das nicht. Ähm, also da glaube ich, da, und die, die Tatsache, dass in den, in, in den Vereinigten Staaten die Verfassung, die, the first and the fourth amendment, nicht anzuwenden sind auf Nichtbürger von Vereinigten Staaten, das ist ein, ein fundamentaler Fehler äh, im internationalen Menschenrechtsrecht. Ja, das, das muss sich abändern. In dem Sinne ist das amerikanische System wirklich viel schlechter als bei uns. Aber die Praxis, darum geht es dann hier zum Zweiten, Jetzt haben wir die Möglichkeit, wo wir wissen, was alles passiert ist, jetzt haben wir die Möglichkeit, um erst auch mal die, die Tatsachen rauszukriegen. Da hat natürlich der Vorsitzende hier auch eine Frage, wie bekriegt man die? Na ja, Sie haben schon ziemlich viel gehört. Duncan Campbell hat schon ziemlich viel gesagt und das schon ziemlich viel ist unterzwischen bekannt geworden. Terrorismus, ja, eben. Da gibt es eben, in, in, in Sache Terrorismus gibt es EU-Kompetenz, zweifellos. Dann kann man nicht sagen, wir haben hier eine National Security äh, Sache und da muss die EU rausbleiben. Das ist gerade, was ich sagte. Und ich glaube, da muss es die Möglichkeit geben, dass man das Gerichtshof in Luxemburg auch fragt, ähm, wie weit kann ein Staat gehen in seinen Maßnahmen äh, gegen nationale Sicherheit, die zugleich auch mit Terrorismus zu tun haben, vor dem die e der EU äh, äh, Kompetenzen hat. Also das muss geklärt werden. Endgültig kann das nur vom Gerichtshof in Luxemburg geklärt werden. Und drittens, also das war eigentlich das Gleiche über die EU-Kompetenz. Ich glaube, die EU hat Kompetenzen und die Abgrenzung der verschiedenen Kompetenzen ist nun einmal ganz genau eine juristische Frage. Dafür hat man das Gerichtshof nun einmal. Hello, back to... Um, the, the chairman's question. Um, how to deal with the question that you have uh, these claims for a national security exemption by one state, one EU member state, that affects 
the fundamental rights of citizens in an other EU member state. I think that is the, the, the hot political issue that this committee is, uh, is, is facing. Uh, and I don't think you can duck that issue. We will have to come up with both a political and a legal answer to, um, to dealing with this. In, in, in a situation where terrorism does threaten many issues in modern society, in which it is felt that the EU has to work together to try and protect uh, to, to citizens against terrorism and at the same time the fundamental rights of citizens from excessive anti-terrorist measures. In such a situation, the national security exemption must be minimized. It can only be minimal. Of course, states must have a certain amount of sovereignty. I wouldn't want the EU to dictate operational details. But setting out the basic principles is not too difficult. I keep on repeating it. If they can do it in the, in the uh, national security law of Schleswig-Holstein, which is a tiny little place, uh, quite decently, then it shouldn't be impossible to do something similar in, uh, at, at EU and at Council of Europe level. The Cybercrime Convention would be an interesting angle to, um, to look at as well. Um, states can't have it both ways. They can't say we are in a globalized, interconnected world. We have to work together to fight all these terrible things. And then at the same time say, but I don't want to be criticized when I take action in national security because that is my holy little island where nobody is allowed to look. I'm afraid that that world is over. Thank you very much for your presentation and thank you to three of our speakers, Martin Shannon, um, Bostan Spancic, and, uh, and, and you, Professor. I think now we can, if we change our top table, I think we can go straight on to the next session. Thank you to all of you. Thank you. I just give it two minutes. Just went out in a minute. Just suspend two minutes, please. Colleagues, there's going to be a suspension for two minutes while our speakers come.
Okay, guys, we're finished. Colleagues, we're going to move to our second session. Uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, we're going to focus now on the pending court cases uh, which have been brought in various courts since the allegations about surveillance programmes were made. Uh, we've got two um, particular court cases which are going to be presented today. Um, and I propose that we hear first from our three speakers and then we move to the normal question and answer session. Um, we begin first with the case brought in Paris against X, and I welcome, um, I welcome Dominic Guibert, Vice President of the League des Droits de l'Homme. Uh, and Mr. Guibert, you have the floor. Est-ce que je peux me permettre de faire quatre réflexions euh, au sujet du, du, de ce que nous avons entendu précédemment, qui vont introduire ensuite euh, ce que j'ai à dire. Ma première réflexion, elle est sur le rapport entre sécurité et liberté. Il ne faudrait pas que, au nom de la difficulté de la justiciabilité des faits, nous tombions beaucoup plus du côté de la sécurité que de la liberté. En d'autres termes, ceux qui, la plupart du temps, avancent la difficulté de rendre justiciables ces faits sont souvent ceux qui pensent que la sécurité prime sur la liberté. Et je crains que, dans ces cas-là, l'équilibre ne soit rompu. Ma deuxième réflexion, c'est que euh, tout à l'heure, nous avons bien dit que le quatrième amendement de la Constitution des États-Unis interdisait le type de surveillance auquel les citoyens pourraient être soumis. Euh, et on a dit, euh, oui, mais ce n'est pas possible pour les autres. Et or, or, en droit, ce n'est pas parce qu'une faute existe quelque part qu'elle peut être récupérée par une autre faute. En d'autres termes, euh, ce n'est pas parce que c'est illégal aux États-Unis que ça doit devenir légal ailleurs. Ma troisième réflexion, elle tient sur la notion du secret. Euh, euh, nous avons constaté que euh, même quand euh, les autorités américaines euh, disent que le Congrès et la Cour suprême euh, supervisent euh, ces questions de contrôle des, 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 des communications ou, ou autres, euh, tout ça restait dans le secret. Or, le secret, ça n'est pas démocratique. Le secret ne peut pas être contrôlé par les citoyens. Et ça me permet de rappeler euh, la fondation de la Ligue des droits de l'homme française, euh, mon organisation, en 1898, au moment de l'affaire Dreyfus, où ce qui était répondu aux avocats qui demandaient la publication des pièces qui permettaient de contenir le capitaine Dreyfus répondait « la question ne sera pas posée ». Et ma quatrième réflexion, elle est sur la notion euh, de, euh, de sécurité. Euh, la sécurité intérieure est devenu maintenant étendu à la totalité de la sécurité. La sécurité intérieure, c'est aussi la sécurité extérieure. C'est ce qui permet de, rallier, de, de relier toutes ces questions de contrôle, de contrôle des citoyens, de contrôle des frontières, à tout ce qui fait qu'aujourd'hui, le mot emblématique, c'est forteresse. Et forteresse, ça m'oblige à rappeler que l'actualité, elle est tragique. C'est celle de la forteresse et c'est celle de Lampedusa. J'en viens maintenant à ce que je voulais euh, vous présenter, à savoir la plainte, comme l'a dit le Président, euh, comme la plainte que euh, nous avons déposée devant le parquet de Paris. Donc la FIDH, Fédération internationale des droits de l'homme, et la LDH, Ligue française des droits de l'homme, ont saisi le 11 juillet 2013 le procureur de la République près le tribunal de grande instance de Paris d'une plainte contre X en raison des faits révélés par Edward Snowden. Agissant tant en raison de leur objet social qu'il est conduit à faire sanctionner les atteintes aux libertés individuelles en matière de traitement informatisé, qu'à titre personnel, la FIDH et la LDH ont déposé plainte sur le fondement des articles du Code pénal qui sanctionnent l'accès frauduleux à un système informatisé, la collecte de données à caractère personnel par un moyen frauduleux, l'atteinte volontaire à la vie privée et l'utilisation et la conservation d'enregistrements et de documents obtenus par l'atteinte à la vie privée. Les révélations faites dans la presse par Snowden ont permis de dévoiler l'existence du programme américain nommé PRISM. Sous couvert de la lutte contre le terrorisme et la criminalité organisée, ce système d'interception des données privées, qui concerne tout autant les citoyens américains que les associations et individus étrangers, 
a permis à la NSA et au FBI de collecter des données matérielles hébergées par les serveurs des sociétés agissant sur le net. L'essence même de ce système donnant lieu à la surveillance d'un demi-milliard de communications par mois est, notamment au travers de mots-clés, d'appréhender non seulement l'origine d'un message privé, mais aussi son destinataire ainsi que son contenu, quel que soit le moyen technique utilisé pour la transmission de ce message. Cette intrusion sans contrôle dans la vie de chacun constitue un danger pour les libertés individuelles qui doit être enrayé sous peine de mettre en cause gravement l'état de droit. La FIDH et la LDH saisissent donc la justice française afin qu'une information judiciaire portant sur les faits soit ouverte. Il convient de dire que le parquet a jugé que cette plainte était recevable. Nous attendons avec intérêt les procédures d'instruction concernant des entités dont la puissance pouvait paraître, apparaître comme parfaitement protectrice et dissuasive. La FIDH et la LDH ont considéré que puissance des unes n'équivalait pas à impuissance des autres et que ce combat méritait d'être mené. L'argumentation que nous avons présentée a consisté à rappeler l'existence pénale des infractions sur lesquelles se fonder, établir la matérialité des faits, définir ensuite les raisons des associations à se porter en justice, rappeler les compétences à juger des juridictions françaises et enfin à détailler les infractions commises justiciables des articles du Code pénal. Je suivrai ce plan pour présenter mon propos. Premièrement, sur la matérialité des faits. Les documents recueillis ont été classés secret défense et révèlent que la NSA et le FBI disposent d'un accès direct aux serveurs de neuf sociétés américaines exerçant dans le domaine de l'Internet, soit Microsoft depuis 2007, Yahoo depuis 2008, Google, Paltac et Facebook depuis 2009, YouTube et Skype depuis 2010, AOL depuis 2011, et enfin Apple depuis 2012. Le programme PRISM leur permet de collecter des données matérielles hébergées par les serveurs de ces sociétés, incluant notamment les historiques de recherche et de connexions effectuées sur le net, le contenu des emails, de communications audio et vidéo, des fichiers photos, des transferts de documents, ainsi que le contenu de conversations en ligne. Cette collecte de données s'opère sur le trafic d'informations effectuées et à ou vers l'étranger et directement sur les serveurs des sociétés concernées. Il s'agit d'une surveillance électronique de masse, telle que l'explique Edward Snowden, je cite, « La NSA a construit une infrastructure qui lui permet d'intercepter pratiquement tout. » Il précise pour ailleurs, je cite encore, « Mais d'une manière générale, la réalité est la suivante. Si la NSA, le FBI, la CIA, le DIA et d'autres veulent interroger des bases de données brutes de renseignements électroniques, ils peuvent entrer et obtenir ce qu'ils veulent. Numéro de téléphone Mail, identifiant, numéro unique d'un téléphone portable, ce qu'on appelle le numéro mail, tout ça c'est pareil. Les restrictions portées à cet accès sont de nature politique et non technique, elles peuvent changer à tout moment. Ainsi, à raison d'un demi-milliard de communications privées surveillées par mois, selon les documents recueillis, la NSA a déjà collecté plus de 97 milliards d'informations en mars 2013. À cet égard, les sociétés susvisées ont formellement démenti non seulement avoir eu connaissance de ce programme, mais aussi avoir fourni un accès à leurs serveurs. À titre d'exemple, Steve Dowling, porte-parole d'Apple, soutient n'avoir jamais entendu parler de PRISM ou fourni aux agences du gouvernement un accès direct aux serveurs de la société. Pourtant, l'administration américaine affirme que le programme PRISM était déjà connu depuis 2006. À ce titre, le président Obama précise, je cite, « Ce que nous avons, ce sont deux programmes » qui ont d'abord été autorisés par le Congrès et encore confirmés par le Congrès. De plus, les experts estiment que les sociétés concernées ne pouvaient ignorer la collecte des données matérielles hébergées sur leurs serveurs et auraient même été tenues de mettre en place les moyens techniques nécessaires pour permettre cette collecte. Le directeur des renseignements américains a quant à lui publié un communiqué dans lequel il affirme que, je cite, « nous ne pouvons cibler des personnes étrangères sans des objectifs valides de renseignements étrangers ». Fin de la citation et ajoute que le programme PRISM est supervisé par un tribunal composé de 11 juges désignés par le président de la Cour suprême des États-Unis. Il résulte des éléments divulgués par la presse que les USA ont mis en place un système d'interception des données privées qui concerne tout autant les citoyens américains... Excuse me, Mr. Kiber, can you slow down a little bit for the interpretation? Slowly. Okay. 
Can you speak a little bit more slowly? Thank you. Excusez-moi. Il résulte des éléments divulgués par la presse que les États-Unis ont mis en place un système d'interception des données privées qui concerne tout autant les citoyens américains que les associations et individus étrangers. L'essence même de ce système est notamment, au travers des mots-clés, d'appréhender non seulement l'origine d'un message, mais aussi son destinataire et son contenu. Ces faits conduisent à penser que, sous couvert de lutte contre le terrorisme et la criminalité organisée, le gouvernement s'affranchit des règles de, 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 de la territorialité pour créer un système de contrôle mondial hors de toute garantie légale et à leur seul profit. C'est dans ces circonstances que les associations que nous sommes se sont jugées contraintes de porter plainte auprès du procureur de la République, près du tribunal de grande instance de Paris, afin qu'il soit informé des faits subventionnés, susceptibles de recevoir une qualification pénale et pour qu'une information judiciaire ou tout le moins une enquête préliminaire soit diligentée afin de caractériser les infractions dénoncées. Deuxièmement, sur la recevabilité des plaintes et la constitution de partie civile. L'article 2, alinéa 1er du Code de procédure pénale dispose, je cite, « L'action civile en réparation du dommage causé par un crime, un délit ou une contravention appartient à tous ceux qui ont personnellement souffert du dommage directement causé par l'infraction. En application de ce texte, et au visant notamment des articles 6 de la Convention européenne des droits de l'homme et 3 et 85 du Code de procédure pénale, la Cour de cassation, dans son arrêt du 9 novembre 2010, a dégagé le principe général selon lequel, je cite, « Pour qu'une constitution de partie civile soit recevable devant la juridiction d'instruction, il suffit que les circonstances sur lesquelles elle s'appuie permette au juge d'admettre comme possible l'existence du préjudice allégué et la relation directe de celui-ci avec une infraction à la loi pénale. En l'espèce, la Cour de cassation a accueilli, tel que l'avait fait le juge d'instruction, la constitution de partie civile d'une association de lutte contre la corruption pour le détournement de biens publics, abus de biens sociaux, blanchiment, complicité de ces délits, abus de confiance et recel, dès lors que, je cite, « les faits dénoncés en ce qui concerne la présence en France de biens pouvant provenir de détournements de fonds publics correspondent aux actions menées par cette association qui, engageant toutes ses ressources dans cette activité, subit dès lors un préjudice personnel, économique, directement causé par les infractions en cause, lesquelles portent atteinte aux intérêts collectifs qu'elle défend et constitue le fondement même de son action, qu'il a déclaré la constitution de partie civile recevable. La Chambre criminelle rappelle ainsi que les associations sont soumises au régime juridique de droit commun de la constitution de partie civile sans considération a priori de l'objet de l'association ni de la nature des poursuites. Les faits visés par la présente plainte portent sur plusieurs infractions en matière d'accès et de maintien dans un système de traitement automatisé de données et de protection des données personnelles détenues par certaines sociétés américaines. Dès lors, la FIDH et la LDH, particulièrement attentives et actives dans le domaine du respect de la vie privée et de la lutte contre les abus informatiques, subissent un préjudice personnel et direct causé par les infractions en cause, lesquelles portent atteinte aux intérêts collectifs qu'elles défendent et constituent le fondement de leur action. De plus, je voulais vous dire, sur, sur les différentes infractions, euh, je les avais classées ainsi, je vais les donner, je vais donner les titres pour éviter de... De, de, de surcharger. Premièrement, les, les cinq infractions sont les suivantes. Yeah. L'accès et le maintien frauduleux dans toute ou partie d'un système de traitement automatisé de données, c'est dans le code pénal. La collecte frauduleuse de données personnelles, c'est aussi dans le code pénal. 
Troisièmement, l'atteinte à l'intimité de la vie privée d'autrui. Quatrièmement, l'utilisation et la conservation d'enregistrements et de documents obtenus par le moyen d'une atteinte à l'intimité de la vie privée d'autrui. Et cinquièmement, l'atteinte au secret des correspondances électroniques. Donc, en conclusion, ce, semble bien, euh, ce sont bien la NSA et le FBI qui sont les principaux responsables, avec la complicité des sociétés qui ont proposé leurs moyens techniques permettant aux agences américaines d'accéder au contenu des correspondances des internautes. Il est vrai que l'on peut trouver euh, dans d'autres pays que cela n'est pas justiciable, mais il nous a semblé que le fait de déposer une plainte sur ce sujet-là dans notre propre pays pouvait permettre d'engager un combat qui, s'il n'est pas gagné d'avance, est certainement perdu si on ne l'engage pas. That's extremely helpful. We wanted to get a, a sense of the case, and that's, that's been very helpful. Um, Mr. Albrecht, do you have a, a question? I, I mean, uh, thank you, first of all, for uh, giving this overview on this procedure and, and your uh, view on the individual uh, redress. Um, I just would like to know from, from you what you would like to see or what you would expect from parliamentarians in member states' parliaments and in the European Parliament and on respective governments to happen besides individual redress and individual cases. Thank you. And maybe if, if I could just add to that as well, just um, the, my other colleagues are going to speak on the Article 8 case and obviously NGOs have been involved and individuals. So before they come in, uh, in respect of the situation in France, um, how much support are you getting in the wider NGO and voluntary community, just to add to Mr Albrecht's question, and how do you feel you're being supported in the wider civil uh, society, and has there been much media attention? What is your view? Sur ce que, ce que nous attendons des, des, des parlementaires, c'est de faire évoluer aussi bien la législation au niveau de leur propre pays, que de pouvoir porter le débat devant le Parlement européen. Euh, dire que euh, toutes ces procédures sont sans contrôle et euh, se retrouver dans une situation où on nous dit « mais ça, ça ne vient pas, pas grave puisque tous les pays vont faire la même chose » est quelque chose qui ne peut pas nous convenir. Vous l'avez d'ailleurs dit tout à l'heure, Monsieur Albrecht, euh, ça ne peut pas être euh, une façon de considérer les choses comme correctes, euh, de dire que euh, eh bien, ça va se passer partout et tout le monde aura raison puisque tout le monde le pratiquera. Euh, donc nous attendons des parlementaires... Euh, euh, nationaux au Parlement européen, euh, que non seulement ils fassent tout pour faire euh, progresser la législation de contrôle là-dessus, mais aussi euh, soutiennent l'introduction éventuellement dans la Convention euh, européenne euh, ou le, la Charte européenne des, 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 des droits de l'homme, euh, les procédures réglementaires euh, qui nous permettraient d'avancer. Certes, euh, la directive 108 est en train d'évoluer. Vous êtes en train de, 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 de sans doute essayer d'en modifier les aspects. Euh, il faudra sans doute faire qu'il puisse y avoir justiciabilité par des individus de ce genre de, 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 de procédure qui, pour l'instant, n'existe pas. Euh, pour ce qui est des gouvernements, euh, nos propres gouvernements, euh, j ai, j ai, j ai, nous attendons euh, du gouvernement français, puisque c'est devant lui, qui est, devant sa juridiction, qui est déposée euh, la plainte, euh, c'est qu'un, euh, il ne fasse pas obstacle à son développement, euh, et deuxièmement, euh, qu'il puisse, sur la base d'un rendu du, du juge d'instruction et éventuellement d'un passage en procès, qu'il puisse, sur, les, sur ses rapports de force, euh, peser sur la totalité euh, du champ européen. Mais ça me permet aussi de rajouter euh, que peut-être faudrait-il, euh, il a été souligné tout à l'heure, euh, qu'il fallait évoluer, faire évoluer les procédures sur le pays des CP. Euh, Peut-être faut-il envisager une procédure du type de celle qui a été adoptée avec le procédure, le procédure le, comment on appelle ça, le protocole facultatif sur le, sur le PIDESC qui permet à des gens individuels euh, de, fin, de finir par porter plainte. Euh, pour l'instant, ce n'est pas le cas pour le pays des CP, mais on pourrait imaginer qu'il y ait le même traitement avec un protocole euh, facultatif euh, qui pourrait se développer sur, euh, sur, euh, sur le pays des CP. Enfin, sur les ONG. 
en France. Euh, oui, si ça a été déposé au nom de la FIDH et, et de la LDH, c'est parce que ça permettait à la fois euh, de faire intervenir une organisation nationale, la LDH, mais aussi une organisation internationale, euh, fédérative des, euh, des, 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 des organisations de défense des droits de l'homme euh, dans le monde, dont par exemple le Center for Constitutional Rights aux états unis euh, et, et, et posant cette plainte, la, la, la LDH et la FIDH, dont le siège est à Paris, euh, voulaient partir de la législation nationale pour essayer d'étendre vers la législation européenne et, et, et internationale. Oui, nous pensons être soutenus par la peu près totalité des ONG qui agissent sur ce terrain-là. Nous, d'ailleurs, avons essayé de développer un observatoire des libertés du numérique en France. Vous dire que les médias ont été sensibles à cette, cette, cette plainte, je ne le crois pas. En tout cas, ça n'a pour l'instant pas pris l'aspect d'un débat public. C'est peut-être ce qu'on pourrait demander de plus fort au gouvernement français, c'est d'en faire un débat public, parlementaire et politique. Thank you very much. I don't know if Mrs. Sipple has a question. I'm not sure if it's a question. At the beginning of your wording, you made a very sharp link to Lampedusa. And I think what you wanted to point out is that uh, with all the technical possibilities, with all the surveillance mechanisms, everyone can be surveyed, all the data are collected, and to some extent, everyone is a suspect. So you look for data. And you said very clearly that it's intended or it's said that all this is happening because of uh, terrorism and for this reason you look for concrete data with some keywords. But as you were very clear in your wording, I would like to ask you from your personal point of view, are we sure, can we be sure that uh, the correct keywords are used? We have a wording in Germany and I think in many other countries, it's like looking for the needle in the haystack. So do we know that we are looking for a needle and for which needle? And is it true that we look in the correct haystack? Maybe we are lost and looking in the... So would you like to say that uh, all these surveillance measures may be totally misleading beyond the question it's not correct? Mr. Guibert, um, just that will be the final question. And if I could just add one quick question uh, to Mrs. Sipple's question. Um, we also have this um, issue, I think, in the United Kingdom. I'm going to put it to um, the two other speakers as well. But I know in, in France, when we've been doing the hearings, um, perhaps there is less attention to this issue of PRISM than there is perhaps in Germany, for example. Is that your perception as well, and, and why do you think that is? And what about the French um, National Assembly? What has been their reaction? And um, again, what's your perspective on, on this? And finally, what is the timing of the, the proceedings? Um, just give us a very quick, quick answer on that, please. Thank you. In addition to your answer to Mrs. Sipple. Je vais essayer sur, sur la question de Madame Sipel. Euh, bien sûr, je pense que c'est orienté vers la sécurité d'un certain point de vue. Euh, C'est-à-dire que manifestement, il y a des gens qui sont plus libres que d'autres et d'autres qui sont plus sécurisés et plus, plus euh, dire, contrôlés que d'autres. Et que euh, le contrôle aux frontières est peut-être une image la plus désastreuse qu'on peut avoir de ce concept de sécurité. Euh, on pourrait dire que nous disposons d'un certain nombre d'arguments, de, de, de moyens techniques absolument extraordinaires pour faire euh, ce qui est fait sur la surveillance d'Internet, euh, et, et, et que quand il s'agit de surveiller des pauvres diables qui sont euh, sur euh, la mer en situation de détresse, nous ne savons pas utiliser les moyens techniques pour nous en apercevoir. Euh, nous, ne savons pas, euh, nous, nous ne savons pas régler, enfin, en tout cas, euh, la façon de ces faits n'est pas réglée. Et, et quand c'est réglé, c'est tellement dramatique euh, que ça invite à se poser la question sur ce monde prétendument sûr que nous donnerait tous les concepts technologiques. Ce monde terriblement sûr euh, qui reviendrait à dire que si tout citoyen est contrôlé et si toute frontière est totalement surveillée, le monde est beaucoup plus sûr que ce qu'il était avant, ce que je conteste bien évidemment, et euh, qui, qui, qui donne l'idée que la façon 
dont euh, le contrôle est organisé, avec le, le secret qui règne sur les, 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 les mots utilisés, les procédures et autres, euh, est, une, est un déni de la démocratie et en général se retourne vers ceux qui, qui, contre ceux qui l'utilisent. Deuxièmement, sur l'actualité politique en France, euh, je vous rassure tout de suite, l'Assemblée nationale travaille. Euh, elle ne travaille pas forcément là-dessus. Et en tout cas, et en tout cas euh, la façon dont euh, elle a euh, peu apporté d'intérêt de, 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 ou de, de, de mise en avant d'une commission, par exemple, d'enquête, en disant, puisque ça s'est produit, euh, y compris sur les citoyens français, ça mériterait une, une commission d'enquête, euh, mon organisation ne peut que regretter euh, amèrement euh, que les députés n'aient pas jugé euh, intéressant de développer cette commission d'enquête et constater que dans d'autres pays, euh, il y a peut-être une sensibilité plus importante au contrôle citoyen exercé, y compris par les parlementaires, euh, qu'il n'existe dans mon pays. Okay, thank you, Monsieur Guibert, and thank you for your presence here today. It's been really interesting, and um, please stay for the rest of the uh, session. Um, Okay, our next two speakers are party to the, um, the Article 8 ECHR case, which uh, many of you are interested in and have been watching. Um, first of all, um, Nick Pickles, who's director of Big Brother Watch, uh, which is one of the organisations which has brought the case. So without further ado, uh, Nick Pickles first. Thank you. <coughs> Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for the invitation to speak to the committee today. Uh, this is an exceptionally important issue, um, both in the framework of the protection of fundamental rights and the development of a global economy that will be based upon the internet in ways that we didn't foresee many years ago. May I begin by saying that the objective of Big Brother Watch and our litigation in the court is not to bring about the end of surveillance. Our objective is to ensure that, as a democratic state, the United Kingdom's surveillance regime is fit for purpose in a digital age with a legal framework that citizens can both understand and have confidence in. As I will go on to address, I think at present citizens can neither understand nor have confidence in that legal framework. What Edward Snowden has done is illustrate two key things. Firstly, that the scale and the nature of surveillance is far beyond what national parliaments have legislated for, what legislators have understood as the intent, and that the second part of the operation of surveillance, the safeguards, is that where surveillance powers have been granted, they've been exploited with regard to the internet far beyond the intention of legislators and to a degree that few would recognise as a feature of a civil society and oversight mechanisms have proved woefully ill-equipped to perform their tasks. Briefly, in the past week, there have been remarks from the director of the British Intelligence Services um, about the, the value to our enemies. And I would like to just briefly highlight the quotes from uh, Nigel Inkster, a former deputy chief of MI6, who told The Guardian, I sense that those most interested in the activities of the NSA and GCHQ have not been told very much that they didn't already know have could not, or could not have inferred. Edward Snowden has performed a great public service. I hope initiated a debate that will not remain confined to these hearings. Indeed, perhaps the starkest demonstration of how the scale of surveillance has exceeded the intent of legislators is the current um, efforts of Representative Jim Seinsbrenner, the Republican and co-author of the Patriot Act, who is in attempting to significantly reduce the scope of that legislation, having now learned that the law he helped draft has been implied in a very different way and far beyond what he or Congress intended. The response of the US government from the President down to reform the law, enhance oversight and improve transparency demonstrates the very real public interest in these disclosures. It also highlights how the legal and oversight frameworks are not fit for purpose. It is a great shame that the same debate is not taking place in Britain, and I'm sure we will come up with that in questions. However, I would like to note that despite the apparent lack of interest, when we launched our legal action in a matter of days, we had raised our fundraising target with hundreds of people joining our cause and spreading word of their legal action. So while people may say that the public are not talking about this, 
I would argue that they are talking about it. It's the media that is currently letting them down. Debate may be denied by some, but it is not a debate the public wish to ignore. The UK's arrangements with regard to PRISM have been examined by the Intelligence and Security Committee of Parliament. However, they did not examine tempora, and tempora is the primary element of our legal action under Article 8. The committee did not mention tempora in its report into PRISM, so we cannot infer whether the committee was not aware of its existence or did just chose not to acknowledge it. There are serious concerns, as Professor Korf has already noted, about GCHQ's legal oversight and the requirement under Article 8 that the infringements in Article 8, sorry, should be prescribed by law, necessary and proportionate, is far from clear that the UK is compliant in these issues. And this is the central argument of our legal action launched with fellow British NGOs, the Open Rights Group and English Pen, and with Constance. We did initially seek to bring this action in the UK courts. And I think that, as we've heard about domestic remedies, it would be in a great public interest to have this debate in British courts. However, our attempts to have this debate were refused and we were pointed to the Investigatory Powers Tribunal, a secretive and closed tribunal. We thought that, based on previous remarks of the European Court of Human Rights in Kennedy, that this was not an effective remedy, particularly given that views of this tribunal cannot be appealed to a higher British court, and it is unable to make a declaration of incompatibility about statutes with respect to the Human Rights Act and the Convention. So in our case, we submit that technologies have now been developed and for some time have been in use, which do permit the indiscriminate capture of vast quantities of communications data and content, which can be passed between states, which is not subject to any sufficiently precise or ascertainable legal framework and is beyond effective legal scrutiny. We contend that the reported activities of GCHQ constitute a violation of Article 8 of the European Convention and in the relation to the receipt of foreign intercept material, the legal framework is inadequate to comply with the in, in accordance with the law requirement under Article 8 too. As part of our submission, there are legal expert statements from both the US and the UK from Cindy Cohn and Ian Brown and I would urge you all to, to read their testimony, particularly the, the note that from Ian Brown about the breadth of the potential legal authorisation, which highlights that it is possible that a typical warrant authorising the Tempora programme may be as wide as simply discussing all traffic passing along a specified cable between the UK and the US. In a presentation in 2011, a GCHQ legal advisor told NSA analysts that one of the reasons for using Tempora was that the UK's had a light oversight regime compared to the US. Indeed, the unique selling point of the UK's legal regime is mentioned in some of the presentations disclosed. And if there is any statement worthy of examination and investigation, it must be this. As we submit in the documents outlining the grounds for our claim, what is required is a framework that enables citizens to understand with sufficient clarity the types of person and conduct in relation to whom surveillance may occur, the safeguards which exist and govern dissemination and sharing of such material, the framework which exists to guard against arbitrary or disproportionate use of such material, and checks on the authority required to permit such surveillance and limits on the time for which such surveillance may occur. What is required is a legal framework which provides an ascertainable check against arbitrary use of secret and intrusive state surveillance. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. And uh, um, we go straight to Constance Kurz. Constance, just to um, introduce you as a computer scientist and project leader at the University of Applied Science and Technology and Economy in Berlin, but mainly is an applicant in this case. So um, if you give us your perspective, thank you. Ja, vielen Dank für die Einladung. Ich habe, bevor ich zu meinem Statement komme, vielleicht noch eine Information 
die diesen Ausschuss interessieren wird, weil in der ersten Session sich darauf bezogen wurde, nämlich auf den UN Human, also die UN Human Rights Committee, auf deren Webseite ist gerade die aktuelle Information, dass ähm, ähm, wegen des US-Government-Shutdowns äh, diese Anhörung wohl nicht stattfindet. Hier wurde sich ja im ersten Teil darauf bezogen. Ich möchte die Gelegenheit nutzen, über das hinaus, was Nick Pickett gesagt hat, Stellung zu beziehen zu den bekannt gewordenen Praktiken der Geheimdienste, insbesondere zum GCHQ, weil aus meiner Sicht auch als Beschwerdeführerin in dem Fall ähm, natürlich wegen der Europäischen Menschenrechtskonvention andere Voraussetzungen herrschen als etwa bei den amerikanischen Geheimdiensten, denn wir haben in den vergangenen Monaten gelernt, dass die technischen Möglichkeiten, alle digitalen Transaktionen und den gesamten Netzverkehr von Kontinenten abzuhören, nicht nur technisch vorhanden sind, sondern dass sie auch genutzt werden, und zwar hier mitten in Europa und nicht nur in Diktaturen. Ähm, Nick Bickett sprach ja schon kurz über tempora programm die sich eben, äh, das sich eben vor allen Dingen an den überwachten Glasfaserleitungen ähm, gütlich tut und wo ja der gesamte Netzverkehr über mehrere Tage gespeichert wird, um ihn zu analysieren und zu filtern. Äh, diesen Fall bringen wir also jetzt oder versuchen wir nach Straßburg zu bringen zu den Fragen der Betroffenheit, äh, die vorher schon angesprochen wurden. So habe ich aus meiner Sicht keine Zweifel, dass ich zu den Betroffenen gehöre. Ich bin ein normaler, sozusagen digitaler Bürger, ungefähr 18 Stunden am Tag online und ich weiß, dass ungefähr 85 Prozent meiner Kommunikation über genau diese Glasfaserleitungen gehen, also in die Bulk Mass Surveillance unmittelbar einfließen. Äh, neben dem, was Nick Pickett schon sagte zu dem Fall, ist mein primärer Antrieb, äh, nach Straßburg zu ziehen, auch überhaupt an Fakten und Informationen zu kommen. In Fällen, die wir vor dem deutschen Bundesverfassungsgericht verhandelt haben, kam es immer wieder dazu, wenn die Geheimdienste dort Stellung nehmen mussten, dass auch Informationen über das hinaus, was aus den Snowden-Unterlagen jetzt bekannt ist, veröffentlicht werden müssen. Und meine Hoffnung ist natürlich, dass das Verfahren, wenn es zu einem kommt, in Straßburg auch Informationen herausbringt, denn nicht nur, äh, sicherlich nicht nur die deutsche Regierung, auch die anderen Regierungen in Europa haben sich nicht gerade dadurch hervorgetan, zu den Veröffentlichungen von Snowden Informationen hinzuzufügen, die ein Mehr an Aufklärung bringen würden. Ähm, das heißt, neben der Frage, ob im Einzelnen nach britischem Recht die Maßnahmen der Überwachung irgendwie notwendig, verhältnismäßig oder auch nur viel zielführend sind, geht es mir vor allen Dingen um die Frage, ob diese Regelung in Großbritannien den GCHQ betreffend, also das nationale britische Recht, das Kommunikationsgeheimnis des Großteils der Europäer ähm, betrifft und damit, also untergräbt letztlich und damit auch internationales Recht bricht. Denn wie wir wissen, der britische Geheimdienst muss für das Belauschen ausländischer Kommunikation, also etwa meiner und ihrer, also von europäischen Bürgern, Unternehmen eben gerade keinerlei Zielpersonen benennen oder auch sonst keine Sachgründe vorlegen. Sie sind also im Prinzip überwachungsvogelfrei als Ausländer. Und wenn jetzt die Mitglieder der britischen und der US-amerikanischen Regierung ankündigen, wenigstens mal darüber nachdenken zu wollen, die parlamentarische Kontrolle in ihren Ländern zu verbessern, dann ist natürlich hier nur an die Inländer gedacht und eben nicht an Personen wie mich, die Ausländer sind und von diesen äh, Gesetzen betroffen. Für den Schutz vor der massenhaften Überwachung durch den GCHQ bedeutet das konkret, dass der Rest der Europäer natürlich weiterhin außen vor wäre, selbst wenn es Verbesserungen in der Gesetzgebung und der parlamentarischen Kontrolle käme. Das betrifft nicht nur das Belauschen, sondern das betrifft aus meiner Sicht auch schon die Fälle, zu denen ich gleich noch mal kurz kommen möchte, die das Hacking, also die aktiven Angriffe der Geheimdienste auf Infrastrukturen betreffen. Hm. Wir wissen also nach den veröffentlichten Snowden-Unterlagen, die im Übrigen ja auch nicht dementiert sind, dass der europäische Internetverkehr durch den GCHQ fast vollständig erfasst und analysiert wird. Insbesondere betrifft das die Überseekabel und mindestens zwei Dutzend weitere Glasfaserleitungen, darunter auch innereuropäische. 
will bei dieser Gelegenheit darauf hinweisen, dass es also nicht nur wie vorher diskutiert um das Speichern der Daten geht, was legalistisch zu betrachten wäre, sondern natürlich auch um die Tatsache, dass man, um an diese Daten zu kommen, die zu speichern und zu analysieren, zunächst mal diese Leitungen anzapfen muss. Es stellen sich natürlich auch Fragen an die Betreiber Firmenkonsortien dieser Leitungen, die das Abhören nicht dementieren, aber auch keine Auskünfte dazu geben, obwohl nicht nur britische Betreiber dieser Glasfaserleitung betroffen sind, sondern auch ausländische Unternehmen wie etwa Verizon, Interroot oder die Deutsche Telekom, die aber dennoch auf die Verschwiegenheitsverpflichtung nach britischem Recht verweisen und anders als etwa einige amerikanische Unternehmen nicht ihrerseits rechtliche Schritte ähm, gegen diese Verpflichtung vornehmen. Wir haben heute viel über die Überwachung gesprochen. Ich möchte aber gerne neben diesen Fragen, die die Eingriffe in die Privatsphäre von Menschen betreffen, auch darüber sprechen, wie wir mit den offensiven Angriffen auf kritische Infrastrukturen von Nachbarländern umgehen. Der, der Fall des geheimdienstlichen Hackings von Belgacom ist hier schon angesprochen worden. Wir reden hier also nicht davon, dass es primär darum geht, dort Daten zu erlangen. Das ist zwar das Ziel, aber was eigentlich getan wurde, ist nicht Spionage, sondern ein aktiver Angriff, bei dem eine große Zahl der Rechner von Belgacom kompromittiert wurden. Und zwar so weit kompromittiert wurden, dass die Rechte des ausländischen Dienstes hier so weit reichten, dass im Prinzip alle Administratorfunktionen auf diesen Rechnern benutzt werden konnten. Das ist also ganz klar ein Angriff auf die nationale Souveränität eines, eines befreundeten EU-Landes. Die Computer dieses belgischen Unternehmens, Belgacon, das teilweise im Staatsbesitz ist, wurde also heimlich mit professioneller Schadsoftware infiltriert, um an sämtliche Passwörter und auch an die kryptografischen Schlüssel zu kommen und diese abzugreifen, die Informationen dazu wenn Sie sie nachlesen möchten, finden sich in der Presse, vor allen Dingen in der belgischen. Das habe ich in der Stellungnahme kurz verlinkt. Ich will nur darauf hinweisen, Kunden von Belgacom sind unter anderem Sie als EU-Parlament und die Europäische Kommission, aber auch zum Beispiel die Betreiber von SWIFT oder die NATO. Wir haben hier also ähm, ja, nicht nur die nationale Souveränität betroffen, die durch diese Hacking-Angriffe ähm, in Frage gestellt wurde, sondern eben auch in der nationalen Organisation. Dazu würde man auch noch das bisher noch nicht erwähnte Edge Hill Programm des GCHQ erwähnen müssen. Das ist sozusagen das britische Pendant von Bullrun, dem NSA-System. Mit Edge Hill führt der britische Geheimdienst ein systematisches Untergraben und Umgehen von Verschlüsselungsmaßnahmen durch bis heute. Daran ändert sich ja auch nichts. Wir debattieren zwar über die Überwachung und das Hacking, aber es, die Programme werden ja weitergeführt und man kann dieses Edge Hill Programm ohne Zweifel als ein ganz großes Antisicherheitsprogramm begreifen und äh, durch, auch als eine generelle Unterminierung des Vertrauens und die alltägliche Kommunikation über die Netze, die dadurch nachhaltig kompromittiert wird. Hier hat man die typischen geheimdienstlichen Methoden gesehen. Man hat also versucht, Hintertüren in Verschlüsselungsalgorithmen einzubauen. Man hat V-Männer eingeschleust, was halt so Geheimdienste machen. Und man zielt insbesondere auf die Service Provider wie Hotmail, Yahoo, Google, Facebook. Ich will vielleicht zum Schluss kommen. Sie können weitere Bemerkungen von mir natürlich gerne in der Stellungnahme nachlesen. Ich bin natürlich der Auffassung, dass wir mit dem nun vorhandenen detaillierten Wissen von den kaum durch irgendwelche Kontrollen behinderten Geheimdiensten, dass wir uns damit nicht abfinden dürfen. Und das ist selbstverständlich einer der Gründe, warum meine Mitstreiter und ich diese Beschwerde vor dem Europäischen Gericht so vorgelegt haben. Ähm, dennoch müssen wir aus meiner Sicht politische Antworten finden, die darauf hinauslaufen, dass zumindest die europäischen Regierungen dem Fernmeldegeheimnis und dem Recht auf eine digitale Privatsphäre einen deutlich höheren Stellenwert einräumen und so etwas wie digitale Nicht-Angriffspakte untereinander geschlossen werden, sodass die Integrität der technischen Infrastrukturen gegenseitig nicht kompromittiert wird. Vielleicht als letzte Bemerkung zu, ihrem, zu dieser Heuhaufen-Analogie, die wir jetzt häufig hören. Ich darf daran erinnern, dass ähm, sowohl der jetzige wie auch der äh, vergangene ähm, Chef der NSA immer wieder darauf hingewiesen hat, dass es gerade nicht um die Nadel im Heuhaufen geht, sondern dass es darum geht, den gesamten Heuhaufen aufzuzeichnen. Und ich denke, gegen diese Ideologie müssen wir uns wehren und wir werden es vor Gericht mal versuchen.
Okay, thank you very much, Constance. We'll go straight to questions from my colleagues, beginning with um, Axel Voss. Vielen Dank. <coughs> Entschuldigung. Vielen Dank, Herr de Pickels. Vielen Dank, Frau Kurz, für die Erläuterungen. Ich habe in dem Zusammenhang ein, ein zwei Fragen, und zwar also zunächst warum wir uns eigentlich hauptsächlich immer mit der amerikanischen Seite und weniger mit der britischen Seite ähm, befassen, liegt wohl mehr daran, dass Herr Snowden nun mal bei der NSA gearbeitet hat und dort die Dokumente auch offenlegt, während wir das auf der britischen Seite immer nur sozusagen als Folgewirkung dort haben. Aber ich wollte Sie an sich fragen, wo sehen Sie oder wo legen Sie eigentlich die Grenzen oder wo würden Sie sie hinlegen zwischen der Privatsphäre und der allgemeinen Sicherheit, auch was das Internet betrifft? Ich habe mittlerweile das Gefühl, durch diese technologischen, digitalen Dinge kann man eigentlich das Internet ja gar nicht mehr unbedingt als privates Medium irgendwie sehen, sondern da muss man ja mehr den öffentlichen Raum sehen und ähm, wo würden Sie da vielleicht solche Grenzen ziehen? Und das andere wäre die Frage, wo würden Sie die Grenzen legen, wann Staaten zur Strafverfolgung oder auch zur Gefahrenabwehr auf Datensammlungen privater zu, zugreifen kann oder darf? Vielleicht zu der ersten Frage der allgemeinen Sicherheit im Internet. Ich denke, man muss sich klar machen, dass wir in Bezug auf Sicherheitslücken, auf die strukturelle Unterminierung von Sicherheitsmethoden, die ja vor allen Dingen für uns alle im alltäglichen Kommunizieren und natürlich auch in der Wirtschaft Verschlüsselungsverfahren sind, dass wir hier davon reden, dass die Geheimdienste der Amerikaner und der Briten diese Sicherheit strukturell unterminieren. Denn zumindest einige der gängigen Verschlüsselungsverfahren sind durch Hintertüren oder durch die strukturelle Schwächung der Standards dieser Verschlüsselungsverfahren ähm, im Prinzip nicht mehr als sicher zu betrachten. Das heißt, wir reden hier eigentlich davon, dass die ähm, Kommunikation der Bürger, aber auch die Kommunikation natürlich zwischen Behörden oder Unternehmen äh, strukturell unterminiert worden ist und hält auch weiterhin an. Ähm, aus meiner Sicht ist da aber auch noch ein anderer Bereich, den man erwähnen sollte. Sie wissen sicher mit Sicherheitslücken gegen gängige Betriebssysteme und gängige Browser, die häufig die Angriffswege sind, um Computersysteme anzugreifen. In diesem Bereich existiert schon lange ein grauer Markt und ein schwarzer Markt. Das heißt, diese Sicherheitslücken werden gekauft und verkauft. Und Teil der Snowden-Enthüllung ist auch, dass im Wesentlichen dieser Schwarzmarkt von den staatlichen Behörden bedient wird. Das heißt, die Geheimdienste kaufen diese Sicherheitslücken und lassen diesen Markt an Exploits, wie diese Sicherheitslücken häufig genannt werden, überhaupt erst am Leben. Das heißt, wir sehen hier eigentlich ein, ähm, tja, wir müssen eigentlich unsere Cybercrime-Communities gegen die Geheimdienste wenden, damit sie diese strukturelle Unsicherheit ja, strafrechtlich verfolgen. Zu Ihrer zweiten Frage. Selbstverständlich bin ich der Ansicht, dass digitale Daten zur Strafverfolgung genutzt werden dürfen. Dafür gibt es auch in allen Ländern in Europa Gesetze. Das betrifft auch die Daten etwa von Privatunternehmen, auf die sehr wohl zugegriffen werden darf, wogegen ich mich, wie sehr viele meiner Vorredner wende, ist selbstverständlich die anlasslose, das anlasslose Festhalten. Von, von Daten aus präventiven Gründen. Do you have a, we can, uh, Jan, do you have a question? Ja, vielen Dank ähm, fürs Hiersein und ähm, auch für die Ausführungen und <lacht> für ähm, die Antworten jetzt. Ich, würde eigentlich ganz gerne eine Frage nur stellen und zwar, wenn man sich diese Überwachungsprogramme ansieht, ähm, Tempora, Prism und so weiter, äh, wie sie auch alle heißen, unterschiedliche Richtungen, unterschiedliche Technik, aber ähm, 
mir, mir stellt sich die Frage, wie wahrscheinlich vielen Menschen da draußen, was genau passiert da und was ist damit vergleichbar, wenn man es auf die analoge Welt sozusagen überträgt? Das ist jetzt äh, eine große Frage, aber ich glaube, ähm, dass sie in dieser Runde bisher vielleicht noch nicht so beantwortet wurde und ich würde mir wünschen, da ein Stück weit äh, einen Einblick zu bekommen, weil das ja auch die Frage ist, wie betrifft das den Einzelnen, der hier ja auch äh, quasi individuell betroffen sein könnte oder ist ähm, in seinen Grundrechten und welche Auswirkungen hat das äh, auf die Demokratie? Um, and then, and then. Oh, it's, it's to, to both of you, if you want to. Yeah. Um, I think this touches on the, 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 fir the first question, actually, um, the scale question. This is something where surveillance itself is not new. And to your question, Mr. Voss, of the, something being in the public sphere, I don't think people doubt that. What's different here is this isn't an individual target. This isn't a, a string of evidence being followed in an investigation. This is collecting everything just in case and then sifting through it using the kind of profiling that Mr. Korf touched on earlier on, which can lead to a huge number of false positives and false negatives. Um, then you have the, the questions, of course, around what's in the national interest. Well, if you listen to the comments of Mark Zuckerberg only a few weeks ago, he very rightly pointed out that if, if a strong economy is in the national interest, now businesses are not national entities. They have customers around the world. Indeed, most of their customers may not be in the country they are based in. So to simply say, um, and follows Constance's point, that it's just about the foreigners, don't worry about our own citizens, actually significantly undermines the national interest because it makes you a much less attractive place for someone to run a business. Um, Mr. Albrecht's point, I think, this is the, the, the fulcrum of where rights and technology become a huge problem, because what is now possible in terms of processing, in terms of volume of data, means that in Britain we have the, the Law Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act, written in the year 2000, which talks of these external communications, but that was written at the time where it was copper telephone cable, not fiber optic internet cable. So you have old law being applied to new situations and new technology, which then enables a scale of surveillance which is unprecedented and, personally speaking, I do not think was intended by legislators either in the US or in the UK. Also ich würde nur eine kurze Bemerkung machen zu der letzten Frage. Natürlich gibt es aus meiner Sicht als, als, als Technikerin keine es gibt keine Entsprechung in der physischen Welt für die Möglichkeiten, die man heute durch eine digitale Überwachung haben kann. Ich glaube auch, dass es jedem bewusst ist, wir haben längst mehr Smartphones als, als Menschen in Europa, dass diese Form von digitaler Aufzeichnung, von Alltagsaktivitäten keine, keine, wirklichen, keine analogen Vergleichssysteme mehr hat. Natürlich, also mich triggert die Frage, ganz kleinen Blick in die Zukunft zu werfen. Wir sollten uns natürlich klar machen, dass nicht nur die Computer kleiner werden, in unsere Körper wachsen und äh, dass die Geräte, mit denen wir uns geben, aber auch die Dinge, mit denen wir im Büro und zu Hause arbeiten, auch aktive, ähm, ja, Informationen sammelnde Gerätschaften sein werden in Zukunft, in einer relativ schnellen Zukunft. Äh, also in drei bis fünf Jahren. Also dass wir natürlich äh, die, System die Problematik, die wir heute besprechen, über diese massenhafte abhören, vor allen Dingen auch vor dem Hintergrund debattieren müssen, dass wenn wir es jetzt nicht stoppen, sich letztlich auch auf eine uns ubiquitär umgebende digitale Umgebung überspringen wird, die kommt, die schon beginnt. Also ja, vielleicht würde ich als letztes noch verweisen auf die Studie von Mr. Moller, der, um noch mal zu dieser Sicherheitsfrage, die Sie hatten, zurückzukommen, der untersucht hat die 53 letzten Terroranschläge oder Terrorversuche in den USA, in denen sämtlich keiner der Geheimdienste dazu beitrug, die zu verhindern oder aufzuklären, sondern wie immer eine ordentliche, gute Strafverfolger und Polizeiarbeit. Thanks. Feeling stressed enough. 
Thanks, Constance. Anna Gomez. I would like to ask you, uh, what would you, from your angle as a scientist and, and having knowing the implications, including for the future, what would you suggest we, we ask from the U.S. and also our authorities who are actually engaging in this kind of, of practices? Is it uh, about, you mentioned a pact of non-attack, but is that pact, pact going to be worth more than the existing data privacy law that they do not respect? or the broader international law, confidence and so on, that they do not respect, obviously. Uh, is it uh, about uh, increasing the parliamentary scrutiny so that indeed they, at the national level it will be indeed, and at the whatever level, uh, there will be monitoring of what, uh, of what is being happening. Is it also in what concerns the U.S redress for European citizens that simply is not existing. So what else? Can I ask him um, if there are any other members who have got questions and I can do a job lot. Can I just ask him, um, Nick, um, in particular, uh, in this case it wouldn't have gone without um, notices coming from the UK. It's uh, an interesting case which, I mean, for those who don't know, it cuts across party political lines, which I think is a very, well, it's a good thing, I think objectively that can be said. Um, and the question I have, I mean, you, your presentation and, and Constance's presentation, by the way, is on the, on the website, so I don't want to ask questions which, you know, are clearly set out in your uh, very clear presentation. So I really want to ask the question about what you perceive um, is going to be changed by the, by the action. I mean, obviously, judicially, we'll see what happens. But politically, what can be changed? We, we discussed in, in the first presentation um, what effect this, this case is having in France compared to where it's taken more seriously in Germany. There is a problem in, in the UK for all sorts of political, cultural uh, reasons. What do you perceive is going to change here? I mean, I, I see Jacob Applebaum is here. He spoke about this sort of demarcation between how people talk about security, the line between security and... Um, uh, freedom and whether that's even, if I remember his description, whether that's even a kind of a line people should draw and all sorts of questions like this. But in the UK, I perceive that this case has been taken, but already, if you don't mind me saying, objectively, it's already been lost. I mean, are people really focusing on this? And if they are, what do they perceive that you're trying to achieve? This may seem like a naive question but if it's got if this is going to go beyond you know an inquiry like this or similar national inquiries to really be meaningful uh, to people what is it that they are going to achieve um, or you seek to achieve for, for a citizen if you can because uh, you've been very articulate in your presentation but try and encapsulate it for this inquiry for the web stream um, as to what it would achieve politically if judicially it, it hits a wall um, you know, what would you achieve from the case? I, th I think, as Constance has already alluded to, one of the fundamental problems here is a lack of information about what has happened. Uh, the US government, to its, its limited credit, has at least declassified some legal opinions. We've seen some movement towards greater transparency, towards some movement of allowing companies to inform their customers about what is going on. And I think that debate will come in the UK. Uh, the Intelligence and Security Committee itself said it has doubts as to whether the existing legal framework is adequate. I think we, we do have a problem that our safeguards are currently seen as very closed, very establishment bodies. The idea of ordinary citizens bringing legal action is something which has not been a pressing public issue in the UK for a range of issue, reasons. Um, I think that, that, that there's two important points. Firstly, Britain prides itself on having the mother of parliaments, and our foreign secretary has led the way in terms of foreign policy about having frameworks at home that, if they are copied around the world, protect the rights of journalists, of human rights activists, of politicians, to ensure a civil society. And I think we are 
very dangerously coming close to a point where we do not have the moral authority to make those kind of assertions in a way that we have done to the credit of, of this government. Um, and I think the second part is, it's, it's Mr. Albrecht's point, people have not yet perceived the scale of what is going on. And if the legal action does not succeed in its primary aim, uh, and based on the rulings of Kennedy and, and other cases, I think we, we do have a good chance, then at least I hope we can inform the debate in Britain to a point where the public realise, as they have in Germany and in the US, that this is a, an, an enormously significant issue and that you see the cross-party concern in other countries come to the fore. And I think we're moving in that direction, but perhaps less, with less pace than, than I and others would, would like. So, are, are there any other, any other questions? Brigitte, do you have anything? So, okay. I think I'll be drawing to the close. In shock, we're closing before the end of time. But uh, sorry to anyone watching on the web stream, this is like just shock from the chair that we're not over time. Um, could I just thank, particularly thank the members who have attended and particularly um, to um, Brigitte Sippel, Jan Albrecht, um, Mr. Voss, um, for attending every single hearing. Um, I think it, it, it's a remarkable thing to do, all eight hearings. I particularly want to thank them for, for doing that and um, thank our speakers again for their excellent contributions in this session and to all the... And could I thank... Um, just take this opportunity, it has been web-streamed, to thank... This is the eighth hearing, to thank our Secretariat for their um, excellent efforts in particular and... Um, all of our staff as well. Um, just on this eighth hearing, it's been a, a remarkable effort. Um, the speakers don't know what I'm talking about, but you're here as a result of their excellent efforts. So thank you again. I'm, I'm not going to be in the chair again, so this is just my uh, chance to do it. Thank you. No idea how long I've been speaking for. Yeah, just say, the, the clock didn't come up. <laughs> <laughs>